So talk about I, I, okay. All right, Larry. So yeah, so welcome to the podcast here, and uh, I'm joined here by Mike Bull. And uh, you know, so go ahead. You were we were going to introduce a book, so I think we'll start off with that. Yeah, because uh, we were exchanging ideas, and uh, for those readers that are interested in environmental sociology, I picked this one up at a half price bookstore uh, for like eight bucks, and uh, it's a really great read, especially for people who are familiar with. Uh, you know how sociologists look at like population, environmental pollution, urbanization. I mean, it's just, it's a great book. It's a great read. Uh, nice graphs, nice you know uh, explanation for just basic concepts. So I recommend it. <laughs> Plus other books, but this is a really good one. This is like uh, I remember you, I had this one when I took my environmental sociology class. It was really good. Uh, so what's the basic premise in environmental sociology? I mean, I must assume that it's about, you know, people and uh, their, you know, relationship to, you know, nature. Um, huh. And, you know, you know, basically, I mean, are these like two, you know, s- separate systems, but they really uh, should be part of the same thing, right? Because yeah. you know, we cannot live independently uh, from nature. I think the way Michael Bell uh, kind of sets it up, and the way I remember taking the class, there are things that overlap, including uh, public policy, you know, the institutions uh, of society, public opinion. Uh, then there's environmental, you know, e- ecological stuff. So it sort of gets converged together. So I think the idea for sociologists is when they study the environment, they look at all different you know, uh, spheres that influence how we understand the environment, you know. So it's theoretical, it's uh, uh, statistics, there's some statistics too. So it's depends on how you want to teach it, I guess, if you ever, <laughs> every, uh, I had a pretty good teacher. So if you have an environmental, do you have a teacher in environmental sociology? I never know. I never have. I, never, I haven't had the opportunity yet. But like I, I can imagine, uh, most people will differ how they, you know, see it. Uh, if they're more environmental activist oriented, maybe they have an activist kind of orientation. Uh, that was one of my professors at TWU. She has more of an activist kind of uh, perspective, uh, like with the fracking uh, stuff. You know, the fracking with natural gas. So some people have different focus. They'll bring in an activist kind of approach. Some people look at it broadly to look at, you know, uh, globalization and economics. So I don't know uh, how people decide to analyze it, but uh, it would be nice. It'd be interesting if I ever taught it. (laughs) Just throw everything in, you know, just throw it all in. (laughs) Risk society, everything. Just (laughs) yeah, yeah, no, all all together. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think environmental sociology. I think we should pay more and more attention to it, and uh, because you know the complication that we are facing today is that you know we have sort of you know a, an overall growth in the human population, and um, and it's been going on for a long time. I mean, uh, but the rate of change was much greater over the last. Uh, maybe 200 years or so. Um, and, um, but now it's very interesting, actually, because I mean, if you if you follow the headlines more recently, uh, you hear that, you know, there's a, you could say a max population, right, where, you know, like the today, the, the Chinese census came out, and they said, you know, there were 12 million births, uh, which to me, it sounds like a lot of people because I mean, I grew up in Austria it was about nine million people. So, uh, <laughs> New York City nine, also around with that population, um, and twelve million births sounds like a lot, but the population base overall is about one point four billion, uh, which means that um, you know the trend is towards uh, you know much quicker aging uh, of the society, uh, and also we have seen. Um, with the COVID pandemic, um, you know, now there's enough time that has elapsed so we could actually see the birth effects of uh, the early parts of the uh, lockdown pandemic 
Yeah. Um, U.S., I think it reduced uh, from 2.1 replacement fertility rate to 1.6. So that the last six months fertility rate has dropped in the U.S. Well, but it was lower than 2.1 even prior oh, yeah. to the pandemic. Oh, yeah. A lot lower, right? Yeah. So, so the, I think the, uh, the, the changeover point below replacement rate occurred about the year 2008. Uh, so that's when we had the last big financial recession. And um, uh, and a lot of people who were sort of originally planning to, you know, have children were basically deferring uh, to to a later stage. Um, and now now the issue is that you know as time goes on, you know, the delayed births become, you know, no births at all. Essentially, I mean, so you, you know, is it, there there are certain limits, obviously, to uh, to fertility. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think, you know, so, so for me, demography is a very interesting entry point actually into public opinion research, um, because, you know, in public opinion research, you know, you always ask people, you know, what is your opinion about, uh, the future, about the economy, uh, about inflation, about, uh, your ability to go to college and all these other things. Uh, you know, do you support Democrat, Republican? Uh, and that's, that, that's usually the way how we understand public opinion research. But in my view, actually, I think you can use uh, demography as a really good way of uh, understanding public opinion. Because I think ultimately, I mean, you take, you know, not the sample of the full population, but you take, you could say a sample of the of, of the, you know, you could say young population, you know, between the age of 20 to 40, up to 45, maybe. Uh, and, you know, it is that group which, you know, let's say still childless or, or only has one child or maybe planning on the second one. Um, and it's a sort of like a public opinion polling on them. Um, mm. You know, if, if you see the fertility going up or down, and that they're definitely reacting to social forces around them, right? Uh, uh, Larry, do you think uh, fertility is accounted for more because of economic change, uh, uncertainty, or you think it's sometimes cultural too? You think it can, uh, you know, be a combination of economic uncertainty, so you know, young people have less children, or something in the culture too, like consumerism, individualism, or something that is causing people to just maybe selfishness i don't know <laughs> i've always thought about this you know maybe there's an effect on it's not just economic but it may be it may be we see that uh especially like in, in europe you know like germany um so maybe it may be partly economic but it could maybe be cultural too i don't know what's your what's your view on or in between both <laughs> yeah I, I would say that you know, it's not possible actually to divorce um, the culture from the economics. Because uh, so the economic element, I think that should be pretty obvious that, you know, people think that they cannot afford the high cost of uh, caring for children when they themselves are, you know, drowning in student debt or, you know, uh, they live maybe in a, in a in a big city where the rent is very high. Uh, and you know they don't think that they could shoulder the additional burden of uh, caring for children. Um, you know, uh, you know the fact that you know the male breadwinner model is no longer working out, right? So you know, men's salaries oftentimes not enough to sustain the whole family. Uh, so that's the economic argument. But then I think the culture argument essentially is that it's about uh, the position of women in society, right? Because, I mean, you know, men's, you know, education and income levels and so forth, I don't think have much impact uh, at this stage uh, in terms of fertility decisions uh, because, you know, because we don't have the uterus. So we're not, we're not responsible for the, you know, uh, the, the, the reproductive yeah. process from the perspective of, you know, uh, you know, bringing out the baby, right? Mm -hmm. Um so it's about the status, the position of, of women in society. And we know uh, from studies um, in 
uh, you know, lesser developed countries that is, you know, currently undergoing a demographic transition towards uh, lower fertility rates, um, that a big factor, um, a big predictor uh, of that lowered fertility is the education of uh, attainment of women and girls in particular. So, um, you know, as soon as they have, um, you know, the ability to get an education, uh, I mean, it, it can mean some like very basic changes, you know, things like awareness of birth control, um, you know, uh, but it could also be things like, you know, having alternative aspirations, you know, to say that, well, actually, you know, if, if I, um, you know, fill my brain with knowledge, you know, why am I not using that? You know, why am I not working? Why am I uh, wanting to become, you know, you could say a servant to my husband and sort of serve him. Um, and instead, you know, why don't I just, uh, you know, sort of live my own life? Um, yeah, opt out of having children. Yeah, opt out of having children. And I think it's a big thing that's happening. Where, I mean, I I saw I, I saw I looked up the numbers of like, um, you know, childless women, um, and it, it's important to look at the right age, age category because. If you say, you know, a 25-year-old woman who is childless, I don't think it means that much because, because the average uh, age of, of mother birth, I think, is like in the late 20s now, maybe even early 30s. Um, so you have to look at women age 45, roughly. Um, and, and, and then you see uh, at any year, you know, uh, what's the proportion of childless women age 45? Of course, you still have a few stragglers. Maybe some women, you know, get children with 46, 47 or so. It tends to be very rare. Um, and you see that it's about 15% of, uh, of, of women uh, currently that uh, remain childless. Um, and and, it's, and it's, a, but it's very striking that, like, that number hasn't, that, that proportion has increased substantially yet. Um, but... I don't know. I mean, if we're hit by another, you know, pandemic, maybe, uh, then, 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 then that proportion will almost certainly increase. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and then another thing that we should think about with the demographic decisions um, is climate change. I, I don't know whether you followed, like, yeah, uh, the, it was a big topic. Uh, yeah. Last year, when uh, that was when, you know, um, the, uh, uh, global school strike movement uh, under Greta Thunberg and others were sort of rising up, and uh, and they did an interview with uh, with AOC Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. She's a congresswoman from New York, um, and she sort of represents the you could say millennial generation, uh, really one of the firebrand uh, progressive leaders in Congress. And and one of the interviewers was asking her, well. What do you think about uh, the premise of this you know, Earth Strike movement, uh, which also includes uh, a birth strike, right? The idea that that young people don't want to have kids because of the um, because of the ripple on effects on onto climate change. Because okay, you know, if you bring in additional people, it means that you have to grow more food, that you have to you know, basically convert more land into, uh, you know, agricultural fields that you have to, you know, dig deeper uh, into fracking wow. and oil and gas and all these other Sounds things. Sounds eco-feminist, somewhat crosses over to eco-feminism, right? A little bit of eco-feminist thought. It's a combination of, you know, uh, patriarchy is the problem and we have to go back to the roots of nature and, you um, I guess it crosses over sometimes with ecofeminist thought, you know. Uh, yeah, I haven't studied that particular. You have, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's a particular branch. Uh, you have feminist principles, and you try to apply it in ecological kind of, you know, thoughts and practice. So, like for instance, ecofeminist uh, 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 minimalists, very minimal, you know, very little carbon footprint. Uh, you know, live a basic life, everything tied to nature, uh, very anti-consumerist, you know. Uh, I even have a relative uh, in Germany. Uh, she's, she's sort of an eco-feminist. And the idea is that you even don't use, uh, you know, the diapers uh, that are plastic. You have to use the cloth diapers, you know. And you have to rewash. <laughs> right. I mean, I respect the eco-feminist. I think sometimes they go a little too far. But 
but it's an interesting idea. You know, it's a combination of feminist idea and then you combine it with an ecological kind of mindset, you know. Uh, it is a very valuable yeah. idea because yeah, yeah. You know, if, if, if you look at the term modern nature, right, right. <laughs> that, 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 that's already embedded, right, where, um, you know, like if, if you look at it abstractly, it doesn't make any sense because, you know, you know, where's the Earth's vagina, right? Like, you're not going to uh, find that. But, um, yeah, but, but, but I guess the, the idea is that it, it's about nourishing, nourishment, uh, you know, the idea that you know, our existence is really based on whatever the planet can give us, right? So, right. You know, if if we didn't have the right atmosphere, you know, the, the uh, right amount of you know carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen, deep, deep green, very deep green, yeah, yeah, it's like we 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 couldn't survive. We couldn't even breathe on this planet, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. yeah. So whatever nature provides to us, you know, it's nourishing the same way that. Uh, you know, our mothers would be when they are raising us as babies. Um, right. So, um, and I think that that connection definitely makes uh, sense, absolutely. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main problem is um, th that we are facing is, or, you know, the, the challenge that we're facing um, is that people are, you know, less inclined, perhaps, to um, mm -hmm. to reproduce, and part of the reason is that um, you know they're concerned for the for the environment, which you know mm -hmm. is created, created the birth strike movement, mm -hmm. and you know I, I I don't know you know how, how far this will go. I mean, and and it's also like overlapping with with these other concerns you know that yeah, we talked about earlier, which is economics. Um, you know, because, you know, if, if on the one hand you're concerned about preserving nature, you know, like stopping the fossil fuel usage and, uh, you know, a high standard of living through, you know, a jet setting lifestyle, right? Um, and on the other hand, you're also concerned about low wage jobs, um, low incomes, precarious work, you know, as part of risk society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, b both of these, well, you know, three of these things, you know, the culture, economics, and ecology, you know, all sort of resulting in the same conclusion, which is that, uh, you know, having babies is not good, right? Mm. Um, and to that, what that, that's, you know, that's yeah. global transformation, yeah. To what extent you think uh, political ideologies kind of tell particular narratives so I always have these three or four guiding like political ideologies that I see sometimes play out in this discussion. You know, that you have libertarianism, uh, some aspects of utilitarianism, then you've got uh, conservatism that sort of also sometimes is observable. You've got social democratic kind of based ideologies, you know, desiring uh, eco socialism, you know, uh, as an alternative. And maybe the last one, I don't know. Like I, I, I mentioned three kind of political ideologies that play out. You know, there's different perspectives that people bring to the to the to the, the debate. You know, if they're libertarian, maybe they have a really uh, laissez-faire worldview. Uh, don't allow the state to do anything. Everything is based on you know market, you know, and liberty, right? Uh, Interestingly, what's the guy's name? Thoreau, you know, you know Thoreau, the guy that lived in the cabin. Uh, yeah, you know, just live out in nature <laughs> and just explore life without any kind of constraint. That is a kind of early libertarian thought. You might call it a little bit anarchist thought. You know, like okay, what about what conservative thought? Conser what, how can we characterize conservative thought and how it plays out in these issues of? you know, fertility or family planning or what role the state should play. And I think uh, conservatism is, is maintaining the status quo. That's, a, that's an ideology, you know? It supports patriarchy. It supports the, the current carbon kind of system, right? Uh, what about the social democratic ideology? If you think about it, uh, you, 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 you want kind of egalitarianism. You want 
there to be more egalitarianism when it comes to incomes, wealth, not borrowing from your blog, by the way, but also fair distribution of pollution and risks, right? So I think the social democratic ideology uh, also has a role to play. You know, if it's state-centered, the state should take over and regulate more things like, you know, environmental laws, for instance, pollution, uh, speed limits. In Germany, you know, a uh, Dolzen fund. I don't know if they have that in Austria. You know, uh, I, require. I think, they have, I think they have that too. <laughs> Do yeah. they have that in Austria too? Yeah, I think they have that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the state, you know, intervenes in, in production and in EU even. I mean, the EU kind of regulates uh, certain chemicals. And you actually have to pay for your plastic back, um, you know. Yeah. As opposed to here, I mean, it's like you know, they, they give you plastic bags for everything, right? Uh, without second thought. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So th- th- this. I don't know if I went too far with that, but the, you know what I mean by political ideologies. They, they kind of play a role, and there's different people have different mindsets, perspectives of what should be the policy or governance. You know. Uh, I think that libertarianism start, sometimes cre- creeps back into the picture. People have this view that everything will just regulate itself, and you know, uh, don't touch uh, anything, don't 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 mess with the business world, right? Um, yeah. So but, you, yeah, so, I don't know. So, so you have these you know various political ideologies, and you know they might have different perspectives on uh, on, on these two issues that we've now brought up, which is, right. you know, fertility versus, uh, you mm-hmm. know, en- en- environment. Yeah. Where would you place Maltus? <laughs> a conservative? If you old idea of Maltus, Thomas Maltus, this whole population too much, you know, and exponentially the population will grow and the food supply will not keep up. I was thinking that fit into, fits into an all conservative idea of, you know, what you agree or disagree on <laughs> Maltus. Yeah, I, I I don't know whether I would put him in the conservative camp, but oh. if, I mean, so so from the Guardian article that I was sharing like the yeah. other day, a couple of days ago, which yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. started our motivation for this particular podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the author was framing it in terms of optimist versus pessimist, mm-hmm. and uh, and I I think that's actually a very good way of uh, framing the issue because so the optimist perspective um, is that. You know, nature's cornucopia, right? So it's this idea that you can endlessly draw from it, and you know, it, it wouldn't be diminished uh, mm-hmm. at all. Um, and uh, that's usually the view that's taken by you could call them libertarian, um, you know, slash conservative, um, you know, economists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you know, it, and that idea is essentially that we have to produce economic growth. Because you know, economic growth is sort of the underlying engine of our system, right? We have to pay uh, taxes, we have to sustain social security, um, you know, uh, we have to pay our debts. You know, that's you know, whether it's individuals or businesses uh, or governments. Uh, and you know, if you're trapped in that kind of system, then then you sort of become uh, a servant to capital, and you basically have to grow grow the numbers, you know, you have to make sure that the economy uh, continues to grow at least uh, two or three percent, you know, better if more. And, you know, of course, that is, um, you know, that's a very optimistic view of, you know, uh, how you could, you know, uh, create the system. Maintain the status quo too, right? That's in your uh, chart thing. Yeah, it's about maintain, yeah, it's about maintaining the status quo. I mean, it's a belief in like endless planetary growth. Uh, and you know, you could say the contrary perspective is the pessimistic perspective. Um, and you know, Maltus uh, definitely was a pessimist. You know, because he sort of thought that, you know, you. you so, so he has this idea about like population growth versus uh, food supply growth, uh, where the food supply growth. Uh, will always be less than uh, population growth. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, so he sort of frames it in a way that population reproduction behavior uh, is, is very similar to, you know, other animals in the animal kingdom, you could say, which is, mm-hmm. you know, if you can reproduce, just do it, right? Um, and of course, you know, in the first, 
part of a conversation we just established that you know cultural changes uh you know educating women etc uh you know that th you know changes the calculation right i mean it's definitely not the case that uh you know people uh you know everywhere is reproducing at a high rate um but in, but in any case i mean so you know maltas and others and all, all the you know ecologists um you know the eco socialists um we can talk about those two uh who say that you know there, there, there are certain limits uh, that nature is providing. Uh, and, you know, and then the question is, well, how do you know that, you know, humanity reaches those limits? Um, well, you so you could look at simple price indicators. Um, you know, if, if, if prices of basic commodities is going up substantially, mm. um, you know, which means that, you know, demand by far outstrips the supply. Um, then you know that's definitely a resource limit um, that we have. I mean, if for instance, you know, I don't know, like the Biden administration said that they want to accelerate the timetable to transfer to electric vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, it, which sounds good because you know you're of course cutting out uh, the direct demand for uh, fossil fuel, uh, like um, combustion engine cars. Um, uh, there's a, there's a few problems with that, you know, optimism because because you know electric vehicles still have to you still have to produce electricity, so it could mean that mm. uh, that the that the electric source is uh, burns the fossil fuels. Uh, and then the second problem is that it, it, it is the lithium, right? Lithium is the main ingredient behind the the uh, the, the EV batteries. Um, because you know it stores a huge amounts of uh, electric charge. Don't uh, forget the price of Tesla cars. You know they're not quite cheap. Yeah, they're not cheap. Um, and then also, yeah, th 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 think about the mining that is required. I mean, oh yeah, <laughs> the, the whole process of like, you know, going into certain regions in the world, usually far away from the population centers. Mm -hmm. So they usually go to. Uh, you know, areas that is less densely populated. Um, I, I saw once a documentary about uh, the, the Mapuche in, in, in Chile. Uh, it's so a minority population, uh, indigenous people in, in, in Chile. Chile is a majority, um, you know, you could say European descent society, um, but, uh, but they have a minority of, of the Mapuche, the indigenous people. And um, uh, and the government is basically going in with these giving out permits to um, to mining corporations, um, multinational corporations. Yeah. yeah, it's multinational corporations, local corporations. I mean, the whole point is like, yeah. you know, re remove the remove the indigenous population from from that piece of land, land grabbing. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then just uh, you know, plug in your you know your your minefields. Uh, and then you can suck out the resources that you need in order to, whatever, produce your electric cars or any product that uh, that's in demand. Yeah. Uh, and so that actually makes you more pessimistic. I mean, I actually saw another example um, was be before the pandemic, the last uh, physical meeting of the ESS, Eastern Sociological Society. Um, and uh, and I saw a presentation by um, by a scholar who, who's like a Filipina, and uh, uh, and she was describing the you know it, you know again the same thing. It's about it's about building some you know resource extraction, some mining extraction in the land in which the indigenous population lives in. Yeah, uh, and the government of course supports that because of this idea that. You know, it's profit. Yeah, yeah, it's profit. It's it's basically eat or be eaten. You know that. That's yeah, I think in Indonesia there's palm oil that's uh, they have to just you know bulldoze lands to cultivate palm oil palm oil plantations, and a lot of that is then exported outside of Indonesia. So yeah, it has really ecological consequences. You know, the, um, just destroying the eco environment in, in those societies, which you know. 
it's very vulnerable. Vulnerable groups also get affected risks, you know, just think of Brazil, Amazon, uh, often affects indigenous. So it's like environmental racism, if you think about it, the term, right? Uh, yeah, so in, in, in order to, yeah. let's say, generate the palm oil, what do you have to do? I mean, you have to, you basically, uh, you have to cut down the trees, right? That, 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 that's the process, right? It's a deforestation. Yeah. Um, and um, it messes up the water resources too, right? Yeah, I mean. It pollutes the water or something real. Conse there's consequences for the communities that live there. Yeah. Yeah, and also for all the other animals there, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it, like you know, most animals, wild animals, they're used to a certain new ecosystem. You know, it's mostly like the presence of, you know, trees, you know, it's because, I don't know, it gives shade and protection and things like that. Um, and, uh, and even nutrition. And, you know, then you sort of do the deforestation. So then, uh, because, you know, these are resources that humans think they need, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then you have this, I don't know, open land cleared up that you could maybe use for agricultural purposes. Uh, or you can build settlements, you know, you can build villages and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a, it, and there is fundamentally this issue of sustainability and whether, you know, we hit those barriers towards sustainability. Um, and and so I, I'm, I'm not, sh well, I'm not let sure. Me help, let me help out. Maybe, maybe I can help out. You mean uh, sustainability, whether those are short-term interests or have long-term considerations? Maybe that's a way we can conceptualize it. If it's a short-term profit interest, it doesn't take account for long-term sustainability. So, like uh, a lot of this uh, focus on, you know, palm oil or quick profits with just for deforesting. You know, they're just selling the wood, you know, in Brazil, that's, that, that would be real short-term thinking, you know, short-term profit thinking, but it doesn't take into account long-term strategy. You know, that's, that's the way I would frame it. I would think of it as a, is it short-term focus, profit focused, or is it long-term next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? I mean, yeah. it's not sustainable, you know, there's a simple theoretical way to argue that how you would empirically do it. I don't know. It's just it's sort of based on value, I guess, idea of, uh, outlook in the next 40, 50 years, what devastation that will have or benefits or risks, you know? Yeah. I mean, and, and of course the issue is that, I mean, if, if, if you did a survey uh, of, you know, really young people, like, you know, the Greta Thunberg generation uh, and then, you know, the people who are, you know, not born yet, perhaps, um, you know, and if you ask them, Hey, uh, what do you think about, uh, you know, yeah, exploiting all this palm oil and, drawing out all this lithium and, you know, all these natural resources um, and, and then thereby, you know, accelerate global warming, accelerate climate change, ocean acidification, you know, whatever, whatever the environmental problems are um, and thereby, you know, make the planet basically uninhabitable to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, I, I, I would bet that most of these people uh, would say, you know, screw you, you know, don't, don't do that. Right. Um, but, but I mean, but the, that's the issue because those people are not, maybe not born yet or they're too young, right. So they don't have any influence uh, over the policy yeah. process. You know, the, the world value survey actually has a question that I once used for research. It asks people if it's representative of the population, that's another story, but they have all the countries uh, and they ask the question, uh, you know, is what's more important, uh, the environment or jobs? And it, it sets it up that way. And in some countries, uh, again, it could vary, like in, you know, Germany, Europe, there's a lot of more, you know, sympathy towards the environment, but somehow when the economy goes bad, some people are willing to accept more damage done to the environment. So sometimes people support uh, employment over the environment or jobs. They care more about jobs. If the again, if unemployment is high, then they're willing to sacrifice mother a little bit, you know. But if it's uh, so, it may vary too. It may vary. 
you said, generational differences. Uh, World Value Survey, they have, uh, if I remember the survey question, I'll, I'll share it. <laughs> but it, it had this two, you could answer it two ways. You could say you're, you would uh, support environmental protection even when the economy suffers, or you would support economic growth, jobs, uh, uh, if it costs something you know, for the environment. I think that's how, I think that's how, how it was set up. But it was very interesting. Um, uh, yeah, it would vary by, by country, uh, Brazil, uh, Japan, you know. Yeah, yeah so, and I think that, that's a very interesting way of, of framing yeah. it. And I, I think it's definitely true that there's uh, some level of trade-off involved. I mean, uh, yeah. between- It's very ambivalent um, kind of, you know, ambivalence, I guess. Yeah, jobs. Towards nature and jobs. Uh, and it's very interesting because if you, if you look at, you know, like Green New Deal, you know, AOC and Ed Markey, you know, are the main sponsors of that bill. Uh, and uh, the way how they frame it is that, you know, you kind of have to do both, you know, you have to create jobs and you have to save the environment at the same time. And actually, I mean, if you read the, the Biden administration manifesto, it's the same thing where they say, well, if we, um, you know, create more solar panels and windmills and things like that, uh, those are quite labor intensive, I would say, perhaps more so than... Uh, you know, other kinds like like coal jobs have mm -hmm. become a lot less um, labor intensive because because uh, you know it's technological improvement, but it's also decline in demand because you know yeah. you know natural gas is sort of the you know the the the, the quote unquote cleaner version, um, and so we're yeah. doing more gas and less uh, coal. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so there's this idea that you'd have to sort of fulfill both objectives but ultimately i think you know in the whole calculation one of the problems that we're facing and i said this in an earlier blog is a conflict between environmental justice and and, and social justice right and uh, you know i haven't really figured out in my mind how you would ultimately bridge the gap but but the idea is simply yeah. so environmental justice is basically about intergenerational justice right it's the idea that you know, yeah. the planet must be habitable for future generations that are not born yet. Uh, and of course, if we do too much, um, you know, sea level rise, temperature rise, uh, you know, fossil fuel burning, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, then of course we destroy that uh, habitat for future generations. Um, and then the idea of, of social justice is, uh, is that, yeah, if you did the world, world value survey in poorer countries, um, you know, middle income countries, uh, I, I would think that m they would be more concerned about just jobs and economic growth. Yeah. Uh, and, and they would be pointing out that, you know, why is the Western countries so determined uh, to limit fossil fuel consumption mm -hmm. um, when it is precisely the burning of fossil fuels which propelled the Industrial Revolution and uh, the wealth of the Western countries? Uh, and so, and so, if you think about social justice, I mean, I mean it in the very narrow, you could say, you know, West versus the rest. You know, that 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 sort of uh, framing where, you know, the Western countries already got rich uh, on the back of your, what you might call climate debt. You know, the debt that we owe to nature by, you know, relentlessly exploiting it and uh, putting out fossil fuels. Um, Manufactured risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the fact that, you know, you have countries that is that are um, aspiring to become rich. I mean, if you think of China as a main example, but there's also other countries in Asia. Indonesia, you just gave as an example. India. Uh, I mean, these are all countries that, um, that, that are in the process of becoming rich um, by basically doubling down on technologies that the western countries had used for uh for, for some centuries now keeping um, up with the joneses globally right everybody wants to keep up yeah and, and middle class right kind of yeah everybody wants to be middle class and then yeah. and then you're and then you have this dilemma and now you can no longer say you know like in the in the green new deal framing that well actually you know we do environment and social justice at the same time because uh, you are you are in, in effect facing a trade off at the moment. Um, right. Now maybe over long term you might be, uh, you might solve the trade off. For instance, with the 
you know, if if we have enough solar energy, or if we have enough wind energy and other other you know geothermal and things like that, uh, you know, we could have like basically emissions free economic growth. I mean, if that's feasible at all, um, then you know maybe you could resolve the trade off. But, um, but even you see the problem is like even with the, the so if you look at the Western countries, um, the emissions of CO two peaked. Uh, I would say in the late 80s to early 90s. And then by that point, you had the Kyoto Protocol, you had uh, the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, so now there's some progress. You see a uh, decline in the overall levels of the uh, of CO2 emissions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, the, Europe is doing better than the US, actually. So you have, um, I think, uh, 20% reduction or something from the peak. Uh, now, but the problem is that it's still not not enough, you know. Yeah. It's like if you had a very high level, you take down twenty percent. Well, actually, we should be going to its carbon neutrality, really. Um, you know, as soon as possible, really. And I think you know people are aware of that now. Um, curtail tourism, uh, curtail movement, curtail population size, curtail energy consumption. Right? You got to curtail it all. Uh, uh, that's how I read it in your blog, if I recall correctly. So in a way, one way to maybe also have a more positive uh, effect is, is uh, you know, we have to reduce our consumption, right? What we consume. I mean, it's yeah. not just meat. I'm not turning, everybody's going to be a vegetarian overnight, but uh, our lifestyle. You know, like, yeah, uh, and this is an attack on basically everything that we said that we valued since the beginning of uh you could say capitalism, which I mean, in in America, it literally is the founding of the country, right? Uh, right at that founding, you said. Well, I mean, maybe not so much in the South, which was driven by slavery, but but, but definitely like in the Northern U.S., uh, the whole idea was, you know, merchant capital. It's about um, you know sustaining economic growth. It's uh, about manufacturing. You know, like um, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, like. Yeah, also your farmland, you know, which also was expanded a lot um, right. at, during the settlement of the country. And so that's why I think, you know, the U.S. is a much more, um, it, it's certainly much more growth friendly. It's much more libertarian friendly, if, if that makes sense, than you'd say in European countries. Yeah. But um, especially Texas, I would say Texas, if you look at its politics, I mean, it's difficult to pass even things like plastic ban. Uh, there's such a business oriented kind of state, you know, that, that I live in, I live in Texas. So, and uh, any kind of regulation, even on the oil and gas companies, it's, it's, it's hard to do, even at a, a municipality level, it was challenging. You have, yeah, it's real difficult to turn around people's mentality, the, very anti anti environmental thinking, or uh, which even even things like recycling you would think is the norm. I mean, some some of the grocery stores they do it. You know, we got Whole Foods here. We have organic stores, but overwhelmingly uh, people don't recycle. So we have problem with trash landfills are packed. Um, so te- Texas is maybe a unique southern state, but it has sort of anti anti environmental problems. Yeah, anti- yeah, and, and so the, yeah, I ahead. mean, so the ecological vision that I would have is sort yeah. of directly <laughs> contravening that uh, what you could call libertarian philosophy, um, because yeah, I, yeah, you would have laissez faire, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that's just oh, okay. the point that, you know, we cannot afford to have lazy affair okay. because of the, you know, ecological damage that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is, you know, a harsh trade-off that needs to be made here now between, you know, what we might call individual freedom and, um, you know, what, you know, ecological sustainability. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, but then it's also very interesting because if you saw that, like and your state uh, gained two congressional seats, uh, which is more than you know even other states uh, got. I mean, there's like maybe six, seven states that got an additional seat. It's, it's, I don't want to go too far, but like you know, the reason why Elon Musk uh, has a, another plant in Austin, Texas, is this idea that Texas doesn't have regulations and it w- would allow sometimes companies to to 
to pollute, to be honest. So, you know, there was this long-term idea that there are a lot of these companies moving away from California and they were deciding to choosing Texas. And it was partly this idea that it was not regulated state. Like it was environmentally, there's not really that many laws. I mean, it's sort of uh, very business friendly, right? It has, it has consequences though. We've had serious uh, problems. We have had industrial uh, plant explosions, chemical fires. Uh, it's this risk, you know, this uh, risk society kind of idea. I mean, it's a re reality. Uh, even Louisiana, Louisiana has serious environmental problems. Uh, everybody knows about Cancer Alley, you know. Yeah, I, I, I just yeah. saw an article yeah. just about uh, Elon Musk. Uh, yeah. On on the there's you know the southern border town in Texas, uh, I think Brownsville, um, and uh, on the outskirts of Brownsville, you have um, like a small hamlet, you could say, um, where SpaceX, which is the um, you know rocket ship building company of uh, of, te of Tesla. Of, of Elon Musk um, and they have like the, the rocket launch sites uh, right there um, and, uh, and and the article was describing the uh, the conflicts between uh, SpaceX and uh, the local residents there so there's, there's maybe like there's not many left I think there's only like handful like maybe 10 residents or so uh, that, that are left in this um like basically, like there's one block of houses right next to where the launch site is on the beach uh, in Gulf of Mexico, and um, yeah, I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there, are, yeah, and so the, the the conflict is basically about um, it's it's a nuisance to to the residents because you know so a lot of people they purchased um, these uh, these vacation homes. Um, that is on the beach, you know, you could say, oh, it's nice to take a walk and whatever, get the sea breeze. Um, but then when SpaceX moved in, uh, purchased a neighboring plot of land, uh, they sort of, um, how should I say, like, like if, if you have like a space site, you know, the launching site, it's really loud, you know, it's probably worse yeah, than... It was, right? Sound pollution, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but and, and, and even like if... Uh, if if the rocket launches and there's some debris that's that's flying down, oh <laughs> wow! I didn't think about that. So then what they do is, whenever they have these these rocket launches, uh, SpaceX then has to go to these knock at the door of these residents and say, hey, get on this bus, uh, you know, and go like you know ten miles away from here. We'll set you up in a hotel room, uh, and then when we're done with the uh, with the launch, then you know you can come back, right? Which That's might take crazy. a few days. Um, yeah, uh, it's an insurance uh, policy, I guess. Corporate yeah, and it, this is policy. a real nuisance. Uh, uh, and now here comes the worst thing: the punchline of the article, which is that uh, SpaceX is now trying to incorporate uh, that little hamlet that uh, as as a village. Oh, turn it into a corporate city or something. Yeah, well, That's see, they incorporate it into in, into a village. Oh, yeah. Corporate, yeah, corporation owns the city. <laughs> right, that's basically what it is. Because then, what it so the the corporation basically becomes the mayor of that village, and then it would have the right of eminent domain. And this is important for 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 SpaceX because now they can say they can throw out those stragglers, who the residents who decided to stay, rather than take the money uh, and leave, yeah. right? So then they make the zoning laws. They determine what the zoning laws are. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Very anti democratic, too. You think about it. Yeah? It's absolutely anti democratic. Authoritarian, um, uh, brave new world kind of world we live in, right? Talk yeah. I mean, corporate, corporate, corporate uh, system in that way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's absolutely awful. But then, you know, this is, this is what they, this is what they're doing. And, and it's almost like I don't know. I mean, like a guy like Elon Musk. I mean, you know, people feel like, well, you know, he can act with impunity, you know, because he's so rich. Um, now it's very interesting because Elon Musk has recently been hit on by, you know, he could say the, you know, like the, the, the 
Twitter uh, activists, right? And they say, oh, well, you know, he's he's getting on uh, Saturday Night Live and he gets to host it. Uh, and, and we don't want to see that. Digital right? currency stuff he's involved in too, right? Um, and, I'm not well, sure about that, actually. Um, uh, yeah. Like your Bitcoin, Ethereum, it, these are real... Like if you look at the at the valuation of uh, of the cryptocurrencies, you know Dogecoin and things like that, yeah. it's gone totally crazy. I mean, especially the last year. Um, totally, because because there's a suspicion by the global investor community that you know all of the you know, hot money that's being pumped into the economy by the, well, first by the Trump administration uh, when it all started, uh, the, the lockdown, uh, and it was followed by now the, uh, the Biden administration. Um, it's going to result in inflation. Mm -hmm. And if you're an investor, I mean, that's the thing that you're always most concerned about because because if your money isn't going to be worth anything, right, um, then it's like, yeah, yeah, every, every every everything that you put your effort into it, right? It's just, it's just <laughs> puff up, and so when they then say, well, "Okay, then why don't we go to cryptocurrencies?" Because the because the premise in the cryptocurrencies is that uh, is that the value can only be created through uh, through data mining. I think they call this. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you you what you do is you have these massive servers, and those massive servers do the data mining and then through the data mining that's how you create your bitcoin right and then the so bitcoin understand it's yeah. value it's a new speculative uh, realm <laughs> I, i'm trying to understand it more i have to read up more on it i know it's a new speculation uh that uh, serious will have serious consequences i guess you know if it has effects on people in the real economy you know or, whatever who's ever speculating in it of course it will affect those that put money into it but i'm curious if uh just we'll see more of this cryptocurrency and all sorts of new financial mechanisms you know so yeah i don't know where to go with that <laughs> I'll, I'll, but but we can't have basic income right we can't have that but we can have cryptocurrency they can speculate on that but no basic income <laughs> right you know my thoughts on that uh Anyways, yeah. Where yeah, we? I mean that that's that's of course a big issue where mm -hmm. yeah, so so the reason why you know you can have cryptocurrencies going wild mm -hmm. um yeah, is because you know well wealth is unequally distributed, right? And then the people and then the few people who own a lot of the wealth, you know, they want to find a way to preserve that that wealth, you know, that that claim on status, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and basic income, you know, it's a much harder thing to to make an argument for because because it's it's true that it would benefit so many people, especially poor people. Um, but 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 those poor people, there's no constituency for that. You know what I mean? Like, meaning that I mean, of course, if you did a survey and you asked them, do you want it? You're like, yeah, of course I want it, right? But then, but then the issue is is that you know, well, nobody asks them for their opinion for anything, right? Yeah. It, it's always about like, okay, you know, uh, how can we ensure that the Wall Street guys and the get their share for Valley share. types are happy? Like, uh, Let the bottom feeders fight out themselves. So, we're, you know, there's a class dimension, I guess. That's what you're getting at, right? Class dimension. Yeah, there's a class so dimension. The cryptocurrency is mostly upper class. They, they sometimes, some of the crumbs, fall down you know a little bit i get that i got that impression it, it sometimes allows some investors you know oh yeah they, you, can, you can get in, get in, in on it right but uh for most people they don't have access to that extra cash to even invest in cryptocurrency you know, you know there's that's the old penny stock stuff remember the old penny stocks people could you know buy penny stocks uh, yeah, and but it's more marking working class people. I think they probably do scratch offs and lotteries at a gas station than cryptocurrency. That's my impression. I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, so there, there, there's this podcast host. His name is uh, Lex Friedman, okay. uh, and I listen to a lot of his podcasts now because he's a very smart guy. 
Uh, and so he comes from the world of like machine learning at MIT. So he's a, you could say like a data, data science nerd, but, mm -hmm. um, but recently brought on a lot of guests on this podcast. So that were from the uh, cryptocurrency world. Uh, and a lot of them were sort of, um, you know, Silicon Valley types. They're uh, also like sort of like data science-y by background because, you know, it takes you uh, some uh, substantial computer skills in order to know what you're doing with the cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, so, you know, even though maybe, you know, all of them might say a little bit different things about uh, about cryptocurrency, but, but there just seems to be this one philosophical agreement which is libertarianism <laughs> it's, hmm. it's, it's ultimately this idea that um, anything is possible right? no no it's, 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 limit. <laughs> no, it's yeah no. about that, no. but it's also about you know specifically about money so so the yeah. whole libertarian argument is that you know fiat currency which is currency that the government creates right so that like if you if you if you read the hundred dollar bill it says you know Federal Reserve note, your full faith credit uh, of the U.S. government, or something like that, right? Uh, and 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 then uh, what the what the cryptocurrency guys are saying is, no, 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 this is we cannot trust that because we can, we we just saw you know how much money the 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 Fed uh, was pumping into the economy, uh, which isn't backed by anything, right? Because like I mean, if if any you know if if the government ever struggles to pay the bills, what they do is they just issue uh new treasury securities right yeah and and that's it's basically it's a computer program in the federal reserve which says you know mm. this amount of money uh exists now do you, do you um, think that the, this crypto currency mania is partly utopian too i mean financial kind of you know anything is possible and if we can make money off of finances and we create new systems and and very utopian like uh but interestingly these are the investor types they create their own utopian uh world and, uh which usually you know the left was accused of being too too utopian but now we see it going in a direction of finance and money making right um it's very it sounds very utopian yeah <laughs> What are the limits? You know, think of even the symbols and the labels they use, like the doggy coin and the, it's just very symbolic, metaphoric, you know? Um, uh, so uh, that's my argument. My argument is, it sounds very utopian. They're, they are <laughs> utopian, right? Uh, but if it creates value for them, I guess, uh, uh, I'm always reminded of the Tulip bubble. Remember the, the, bubble, uh, the, the bubble that happened in, was it Netherlands? Netherlands, yeah. Yeah, century. I'm always reminded of that. Somehow this is going to repeat itself. <laughs> you know? Well, that, that's definitely a big part of what's, uh, what's going on because, I mean, ultimately you can only have value in money. Um, it, it is ultimately about faith, you know, like because if, if people don't have faith in the currency, um, then it will not be worth anything, right? Yeah, house of cards yeah. falls apart. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's the same thing for you know the government currencies, fiat currencies, but it's also the case for the, you know, uh, you could say private, you know, created money like the bitcoins, um, and um, you know there there is, I, I agree that there is a real potential for, uh, for the house of cards to to fall apart, um. But I mean, th that's also I mean the problem that we have been facing. I mean, you know, within within you know this, the the stock market. I mean, which has been going up and up. You know, every every year now, um, and even more so during this pandemic. So, um, you know, there could be an issue where, you know, the stock values is sort of completely divorced from. Basically, under, underlying values in the economy, you know. Um, uh, so, I mean, but the system will be prone to financial crises. Uh, I think that's yeah. sort of built in. Do you think there's a lag? Uh, a lag when it comes to the state uh, is too slow to respond because of these new the inventions. Of, you know, these new cryptocurrencies are are so quickly advancing and so quick that state doesn't keep up with laws and like, you know, there's like a real lag effect, you know, like, 
uh, now if they do pass laws, it'd be too late. The, the, the damage is already done, you know. <laughs> uh, but it, I'm, I'm thinking that it's it's so fast, so quick. It's hyper, very hyper financialization, very uh, going in directions that we never thought of, like like with this data mining stuff. And I just it's it's really fascinating for me. But yet at the same time, I'm very curious how the state can can regulate it if it happens so quickly and how much will it suck off from the real economy and you know when it does do the damage then will the taxpayers have to you know pay for the the, the risks after the the wealth was privatized you know uh will they have to you know because they'll have to i guess or they'll will they have to save them if they do go under <laughs> you know I, I find it very interesting because like you know yeah. this year you know when i you know filled out the tax return i mean i saw yeah. that they have this one line uh, where it says, you know, did you, where you invested in like digital currency. Oh, they have that. Uh, and that's very interesting because like, I know like, you know, up until when we, last year or so, you know, I don't think the line existed, right? So I, I, I think the government is now recognizing that. Okay. Uh, that, that, that this digital currency stuff is going to, this is taking off and it's, yeah, could take a life of its own. And, and def, I mean, from a government regulated perspective, that's not what you want, right? Uh, I mean, ultimately, hmm. in the government perspective, I mean, it is true, like, the objective is control. I mean, they want to have oversight over what people are doing. Um, and you lead to damage, or yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's also a national security issue, you know, like, uh, so I don't know. Yeah, um, well, it's about this idea of the social contract where you know, you want to make sure that. You know the institution that has to provide for you know each of our well-being you know like through whatever government benefits and you know food stamps and all these other things um yeah. you know yeah. that you know like the, the relationship between the state and sort of the people is, is always there so to speak and what the libertarians are saying is no no no, no we're going to create our own sphere you know we're gonna um you know the, bypass the, the, um, the power of the state which you Think more of libertarian. Let me ask: Do you uh, uh, think of it more as laissez-faire, the invisible hand, and everything just kind of uh, moves uh, autonomously? Whereas, you know, there's some linkage between some anarchist thought. There's some anarchists that think the same way, but they don't think quite. I think with economics, I get that impression. Uh, so you have some of these autonomous leftists that, uh, you know, they build their own like squatting communities and they self is self-sufficient and they, they want to kind of build barriers around themselves. So they're off cut off off the grid. Right. So I, I see sometimes some libertarian thought crossing over into other uh, uh, autonomous leftist thought. They're like, if they have similarities, but when it comes to economics, they're a little different. Like you know, they, they totally, radically so maybe i'm thinking of american libertarianism i guess or english maybe that's my idea there's a distinction that you have to make here yeah um, you know like you know there's some um oh, go ahead go ahead well so the, the point of agreement is, between the libertarian anarchistic thought is uh anti-statism right so yeah, that's the core that you know we don't we don't want the state to be sort of running things um but uh, the point of divergence um is is on this point of egalitarianism right so it's like how, how much do you care about egalitarian outcomes and uh, you know in in sort of like the socialist anarchistic tradition there definitely uh, is a greater tendency to say that you know it's about local communities holding on together um and yeah so it's like anarcho-syndicalism is sort of in that yeah. tradition you know, people like Noam Chomsky is, 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 is a very big fan of that. Which is it's, sort of, it's interesting because it influences like like even ecological movements, whether you take an eco, like social democratic kind of uh, worldview, the state uh, is the center of like trying to regulate it. And uh, these like eco anarchists, they, they distrust the state even. They, they think you gotta move backwards and uh, be self-sufficient, uh, build earth ships, you know, very eco housing and get off the grid, you know, get, have smaller populations so then you can uh, have smaller communities. Uh, I don't know. 
where I'm going. But they have to- the way how I analyze it is mm-hmm. that, yeah. you know, if we do have civilizational collapse, you know, right. whether it's, you know, a nuclear World War Three, or it could be, you know, another major pandemic that's even bigger than what we have today, um, or it could be devastating climate change, climate refugees, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever civilizational catastrophe scenario that you have in mind, mm-hmm. if that becomes realized, then what would happen is that this, uh, the public faith in the state would, would collapse. And I mean, we, we already see that to some extent with the, um, you know, with the rise of uh, populistic forces, you know, with the rise of Brexit and Trump and such, et cetera. Um, and, um, yeah, and I think those forces of destabilization is going to uh, increase over time. And at that stage, um, you know, at the stage of civilization collapse, what that would mean is that populations would plummet substantially, you know, through wars or things like that. Um, and, and then what would arise out of that, it could be very well be a very, you know, like small scale communities, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like your, your squatter communities uh, that uh, yeah. sort of, you know, seize the local ground and, you know, sort of create their own. Like Brazil, if you think about Brazil, uh, a lot, even the major cities in Brazil, you, you have the pattern of lots of people are squatters and, uh, the state, I mean, yeah, it does intervene. There was a case in Rio de Janeiro like a week ago, uh, actually a couple of days ago, you know, they went in and shot a bunch of people in uh, Vavela in Rio de Janeiro. But like squatting is interesting because uh, it's happening a lot in the global south. I mean, with urbanization rising and informal communities are rising. So this is really interesting uh, development we're seeing. So, and um uh, you know, especially in the global south, uh, we see some of it, a little, some of it in the global north, but I think it's more political squatting, just like left wing squatters, you know, but you see a lot more of this uh, deprivation based squatting, you know, people that are really poor, and they have no alternatives. So, you know, uh, just live where you can, you know, including Mexico. Uh, so I don't know, uh, big topic for discussion. So that, that uh, challenge, it puts challenges of, uh, you know, for the state in the future, uh, more and more people uh, living outside of the, the power, whether they're living in states. Now, there's no question about that, national boundaries. But as far as, far as uh, control, right, for, with the 21st century, it's, I don't know where it's going to go. Curious. Yeah, I mean, so my my yeah. my view, I think, is I'm mean, so I'm a little bit more pro-state. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, in, in a sense, because I I think that the civilizational advances at the comforts of you know what I call civilization, um, I think you can only maintain it easily within the framework of the state, um, and and you know, for people who don't believe that, I mean, like, okay, what well, would you? give up your FDIC insurance and uh, be right. willing to, you know, lo- lose your money in the next financial crash and all these things. Right. So, so I, we, we, we all acknowledge that there is benefits to living within the state mm-hmm. now, but then the problem is, you know, again, we have to go back to this, this issue of ecology because, you know, we, yeah, we're, of course. You bring we, that we, we're never, <laughs> You know, debating these things about you know pro-state, anti-state in in, in abstraction in, in textbooks. Yeah, of course. But it's you know a delivered reality, which means that it's in connection with you know whatever harm that our present systems you know with it, whether within or outside the state uh, is doing to the environment. So, uh, so then, yeah, yeah. The issue is that if our present systems is producing too much. Um, you know, ecological damage. Um, then it, it it's it's just going to favor, you could say, the anarchistic outcome. You know, the outcome with like, you know, wealth destruction. You know, wealth evaporation. Um, and and it's like, and I think at this point, like, you know, mm-hmm. whatever we do, I mean. Whatever we're trying to do is to 
is to do everything we can to avert this kind of civilization collapse. Of course. Um, I mean, you know, like even if you, if, yeah, if you look at what Biden is talking about with this energy transition and with, you know, four hundred billion dollars that he wants to go to um, Keynesian, yeah, very, uh, yeah, it, uh, to, to uh, so, social care, which is a big area, hundred billion to K to twelve. 50 billion on community colleges and uh, state universities. Um, and what what is that all about? I think it, it's a way to it, it's a way to restore legitimacy in the system, you know. Yeah, it brings the state back in. You know, yeah, right. I mean, equation. right. Where where, just, yeah. People no right. longer believe that the state is just serving the one percent, which I mean right. it is also done, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll continue to do, obviously, you know, like, you know, like Biden was very explicit. He said to the rich people in this country, it's like, you know, you're going to keep your wealth. You just pay a little more taxes, you know? Right. Um, and um, so it, it is, it is an attempt of restoration of the social order, um, mm. which, yeah. you know, now it depends what your philosophical perspective is. I mean, because, uh, because I I would agree with that project. Because I mean, so you know, and I guess that would make me a conservative. Because if you think if you think about, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Edmund Burke, you know, if you recall, okay, yeah. he, wrote, he wrote this book, uh, Reflections in the Revolution in France, right? Uh, and he was basically defending the the British monarchy against uh, the charge. Uh, of the yeah. British liberals that you know we have to overthrow the British monarchy in order to create a republic, and then the republic would presumably might be much more egalitarian. And I mean, and and of course that kind of thinking was um, was dominant in in France, uh, yeah. which of course did have the the revolution, and actually it impacted uh, the American state. Because you know the Americans, they said, "Well, we, we throw out the British monarch, um, and we don't want monarchs." Then the model is basically the French Republic, right? Now, so yeah. the thing is that, um, yeah. So, well, why why is it that 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 we should preserve the monarchy from the perspective of um, of Burke? Uh, and it's because he, he doesn't defend it on the basis of its sins, right? Whatever they may be. So it could be, you know, uh, preserving the high gene inequality and mm. a few people that close to the monarch making a lot of the money and then everybody else sort of languishing as serfs and peasants, whatever, all, all this other stuff. Maintaining order, right? Just to maintain yeah, yeah. order. That's the idea, right? Maintaining conservative order. Mm. Um, and he says, no, it's about this idea that we know the parameters of the present system, which is to say, you know, if if this guy is is, is the king, is the head of state, uh, then we also know, who, well, this guy might be the prime minister, you know, this guy is serving in parliament, and we can sort of, we can sort of argue over procedures you know you know you know how do you distribute income and stuff like that um but if you question the process no not just question the process if you overthrow the process mm, then you got a problem mm. yeah then then yeah then you're going to have problems and then so he uses the examples inside of the french revolution <laughs> uh you know yeah. that sounds very close if you think about your your argument to Weber's definition of the state, uh, maintaining monopoly of physical force, that the state, that's the primary kind of goal is to main, have a monopoly over the physical violence. That's, that's how he phrased it, Max Weber, the sociologist, you know? And yeah. I'm thinking that in a way, the state is the architecture of the society. You know, it could be evil, it could be totalitarian, it could be, you know, liberal, uh, but as soon as the state loses the loses the monopoly over physical violence, then it disintegrates. You know, uh, I'm curious. You know, 
Yeah. Uh, so it, that and of course, kind of, that's what you're arguing, right? You have to have some kind of a system. You need to have a system. So actually, Weber yeah. himself, um, you know, I, is it kind of conservative thought? You well, think? his motivation comes from Thomas Hobbes. Of course. Yeah. Right? So because this is well, Hobbes, thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, he he was a guy who, you know, who came up with this uh, idea that you know of the Leviathan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the state of nature where people would basically be fighting each other, and the way how to put the, the stop to to the infight is by 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 endowing the state with substantial amounts of power, right? Right. Uh, and um, uh, and and then yeah, you could you could end you could end the squabbles. And actually, the, um, my my uh, old advisor Randall Collins, he used to write a blog post. Um, and he was commenting. It was a few years ago at the height of the uh, of ISIS, uh, which uh, in Syria, because uh, as you know, you know they they were sort of carrying out terrorist attacks. They were capturing territory. They were drawing the local oil resources to basically make money to buy more weapons and food to sustain the fighters and so on. And so, on. and. And what 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 Collins did was he took the Hobbesian theory and sort of applied it to the Syrian case, and he said, hmm. "What what you need in Syria is you need to work with the basically with the most powerful force in that country, which in that case was Assad." It was very interesting because you know it was sort of, it was contravening the U.S. foreign policy doctrine. Hmm. Because from the perspective of the U.S. government is that they wanted to overthrow Assad, right? This has been always their goal, uh, and the people who backed up Assad were sort of you could say the opponents of the U.S., which is Russia and Iran, primarily. Mm-hmm. And you know, so it was sort of this this belief in well, you know, um, well, Assad was going to be our enemy. Now, the problem from the U.S. perspective is that they didn't have a lot of other alternative forces that they could back up, where they backed up the Kurds mm-hmm. uh, in the northeast of the country. Um, but, you know, there, there wasn't any, you could say, centralized state force that they were able to provide the support to, because the other people that they were supporting, aside from the Kurds, was, uh, you know, basically small militant groups that was fighting uh, the Assad government as well as uh, ISIS. So, um, yeah, but the, but the whole idea is that, you know, what, what Collins was trying to say to the U.S. government was, you know, basically swallow your pride and support Assad because, because I think the, the first goal in any society is, you know, is, is not to create equality and justice. I mean, the first goal is to create order. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the first goal is to prevent people from slaughtering each other on the street. Right. You know, um, and um, and and we were very actually very closest. Yeah, we were at the state of. I guess you could use the same argument with Mexico and cartels. You know, cartels uh, become so autonomous that there's nothing that controls them, and the state can't do anything. You know, I'm talking about cartels in Mexico. You know, they have a lot of power, and they so it undermines the monopoly of physical violence of the state. The state can't. Even if they don't have the, they don't, they have the means, but the cartels have, you know, they have guns. They got, they get a lot of the machine guns shipped from Europe. Uh, where there were several court cases actually in Germany, there were all these weapons that were being sent to the cartels and German uh, legal courts, like find this German gun maker. Uh, but, anyways, I would think of the Hobbesian example would fit probably Mexico too. You know, cartels. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I hope that I, 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 I saw I saw this documentary. Yeah. It was about um, so you know so, so they were in El, El Paso, Texas, which is another border town, um, mm-hmm. uh, and then they drove across. Um, and what's very interesting is like such a big contrast, right? Because the U.S. I mean, yeah. even though it, there's like a heavy gun culture, right? You know, people can be armed to the teeth and. You know, you have like open gun carry laws and stuff. Yeah. Um, but what's very interesting is that, you know, it's it's a very peaceful area, though, right? Um, 
you know, because, you know, because the U.S. actually has a functioning government, right? That's yeah. that's ultimately the premise of it, right? Uh, you know, you have sheriffs and whatever else. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and actually that's where a lot of the cartels is, are purchasing the weapons from, right? So they go to these gun, gun shops in El Paso and... Uh, they bring it over. Right, yeah, and then they, they well, they would usually disassemble the, the guns and then they would put them in the trunk and into, uh, you know, under the seat in the car. Uh, and then they drive it, drive it across the border back again, you know, and then and then reassemble the weapons. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's done in, 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 in large quantities. And that's why there will be no end, uh, at least not in the immediate future. Uh, f- for the gun violence in uh, in northern Mexico, because um, you know, the, 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 the the supply of these guns is endless, right? So we just call it anarchy, anarchy in New Mexico. I mean, there's a total anarchy when it comes to cartel violence. They okay, yeah, the state, yeah, sometimes the Mexican state, you know, they have missions and count, uh, catch a few, but I get the impression that's still very much. The powers in the cartels, even with the smuggling, you know, human smuggling and all that. If you think about it, of course, that's another topic, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's no, that's an, entirely new different topic, but yeah, I mean, that's so. But 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 this point about like, you do you need to have the state? Um, so so I, you know, this is the defense of the conservative argument. You know, the, right, the, right. the Barian, the Hobbesian. Uh, the Burkean view, um, which is all converging on this idea that, you know, the civilization that we created in all of its complexity, uh, I think it does require uh, to have some amount of state control. Um, now, but there's also the risk and the drawback, and I think the libertarians and the anarchists, I, th- I think they, they do deserve some hearing uh, at the very least. Um, because you know, because it's also the case that it is the overwhelming amount of state power um, which created our civilization, but which also created the ecological catastrophe, right? Because I mean, it's definitely true. Like, if you have small-scale tribal communities. Where you know every you could say social interaction, every economic activity uh, is driven by basically trust in you know small communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know you're familiar with like Dunbar's number, right? Which is the idea that you can only know a certain number of people really well. I think 150 was a cutoff, right? Mm. Uh, and then I mean. In terms of number of faces you can recognize, I think that goes into like a thousand or something like that. Um, but like no, people that you know really well, it's only about 150 because because in, from an evolutionary perspective, I mean, um, you know, humans uh, arose from uh, from tribal bands. Right. That, that, that's the, 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 the tribe, um, which is the size of, you could say, a small village, uh, is is the natural unit in which you know humans were members of right mm-hmm. and, and so you know um and so evolutionarily i mean we are we you know our mind still works according to that uh principle right um and yeah but in the small scale communities the um, the amount of environmental dislocation that you can cause is is very small but with, I get it, but industrial, it's more impact, definitely. Impulsive. Yeah, yeah. It's more impact. Now, industrialization and everything, yeah. Exactly, industrialization, urbanization. Now, the problem that we're facing is that, you know, you and I, we are children of the civilization, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, like, how would I know that? Well, you know, <laughs> have, have, have you ever lived out in nature? You know, have you ever slept... Uh, uh, outside you know have you uh you know have uh have you ever um, seen books i read it I read it in books hunted. <laughs> it looks yeah. like an adventurous lifestyle 
right? <laughs> but uh, adventures lifestyle of the books. Yeah. Well, I mean, but 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 I mean, off the grid or something. Well, a book culture. Yeah. You know, an intellectual academic culture. I think it's it's also built on civilization, right? Right. Because I mean, I mean, a component of civilization, a very important one, is literacy, right? This is basically like you know you have these twenty six Roman characters, and with that we can express yeah everything that we with th- we think we need to express, right? Like yeah, from concepts, what? ideas, signs, symbols, language. It kind of evolves, right? This, uh, or is that how it goes? I wasn't into linguistics, but I guess there's an evolution of language and thought. So there's like signs, then there's symbols, and then there's some kind of a language that forms, and then it gets more and more advanced, right? But signs, signs is perhaps how it started, you know, basic signs, as far as we know, I guess. This is this is what I read. I don't know some of the books, um, Gerhard Lenski, the socio-cultural evolutionary perspective i don't know i, I, just, I kind I just, of follow that yeah, yeah. you got that book too yeah i follow yeah. that idea oh, I, I think i think that approach to the study of like societies as a historical evolutionary perspective that makes sense because then you know that you know societies have limitations they have but every society changes over time size dimension social organization so i take that i take that approach yeah i i, I, res- I think that's a good way to think about it Especially, you know, if we study sociology, we got to know what we mean by society, you know, as a unit, right? So, and I think, you know, people look to the past and then they make comparisons. Okay, this was hunting gathering, this was pastoral, this is horticulture, this is pre or agrarian, this is uh, late agrarian, this is, you know, pre industrial, industrial, post industrial, and whatever comes after, right? <laughs> That's how way I always, I guess I teach it intro. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, but it may, it may uh, in some different regions of the world, it may not quite evolve the same speed. And, you know, we still have hunters and gatherers, small examples of it uh, in the Amazon, in uh, certain regions of Africa. So they're small, but they're very small. I mean, it's nothing, you know, <laughs> really small uh, there's a good study that i read by um malcolm turnbull i think was his name okay um and uh it, it was a, a study on on the pygmies um which are located in I'd like to say rwanda or something um right. Hong, congo I'm, I'm not sure it's what they're hunters and gatherers it's, it's definitely in sub-saharan africa right um yeah. And um, and so the pygmies they were say differentiated from majority populations, which is the the Bantus. So yeah, actually, you know, most of uh, you know Africans are uh, are Bantu descent. And um, but the pygmies they were um, when he, when 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 Turnbull made his field work in the nineteen fifties. Mm-hmm. Uh, that time already there was social transformation in the pygmy tribes um, because you know so the thing that's going to break up the tribal structure uh, is is two forces right so the one is is about the land grab which we, you know we talked about earlier which is you know, if basically the government comes in takes the land uh, where where the pygmies lived on and then they they evict them you know or the, you know, colonization too, maybe, and some influence. I don't know what impact European empire. Yeah, I mean, the European colonization, of course, had a huge impact because right. that, that's what brought uh, all the Africans into the right. uh, into the global economy, global market economy. You know, this idea of like producing uh, raw material and commodities that is then exported to the Western countries to yeah. be then you know processed in factories to be then sold uh, all over the world. Uh, so th- that's of course. You know that, that's like a European system, uh, European, uh, you know, I don't know, invention. You could say and it was brought into Sub-Saharan Africa, mm-hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and then of course, 
So if you say 1950s, where it was around a time when a lot of African countries were gaining independence, right? Uh, and you know, independence from the European colonial powers. Uh, and, you know, a big part of, you know, the self-definition of the new countries uh, is some form of industrialization, right? It's about, you know, development, it's about creating factories, it's about, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's about creating more commodities so that people are, you know, are wealthier, right? Because, yeah, I mean, because basically, uh, I mean, what the Europeans did was they 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 basically they they, they brought a drug, and then people got hooked onto it. You know, it's the yeah. wealthy lifestyle. You know, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so the well, way there's, how some to... there's some dependency. Uh, you know, uh, world systems theory. Do you buy into that, Wallerstein? That uh, there was this world system that evolved into you know the the global north, the, the core. He calls it you know, requires resources and they, they acquire it from the periphery or the semi-periphery. And then that sort of evolves into a, a world system, you know, and that's still visible today. I mean, there's still this exchange of resources, of goods, trade, coffee. I mean, palm oil, we talked about it briefly before. So it's, it is a real, you know, thing, exchange of uh, resources, uh, money, goods, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's theoretical, it's conceptual, but it, you couldn't, you can't, you can't empirically prove it. That there's some, there's a world system uh, of exchange, and, especially with the global South countries. We could, we can make that argument. There's no question there. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, of course, everything that Wallerstein wrote about is, is totally right. I mean, so um, he did his PhD in, um, Columbia, right? well, I think in Colombia, but then he, Columbia University and then uh, he went to Brussels uh, oh, wow. in French and uh, so what he did was um, he, he wrote about uh, you know empirical case studies in sub-Saharan Africa you know like hmm. ba ba basically like how how Europeans came in and this sort of you yeah. know, exploited resources and yeah colonization and, uh, and that was and so it, it was those empirical case studies that became the basis for the world systems theory, right? Huh. Which is very, very interesting because, like, it's a little bit like you know in Marxism, right? Like you know, like, like you don't start off with some like abstract concept, you know, like like Kant, you know, like categorical imperative, you know, some abstract concept, and then and then you create your premise, your your argument, right, around yeah. that. Um, but the whole point in sort of like Marxist thought is that you know. That you you take some physical phenomenon, you know, like uh, in this case, commodity capitalism, right? Yeah. Um, and then you string the theory around around the empirical phenomenon, right? And and that, that's that's definitely what what Wallerstein did here. Uh, the I, systems I would give room even for modernization theorists. I mean, you could use modernization theory to argue, you know. Why in, in the developing world it takes longer, you know, and why there's some deficiencies in their economies is too still agricultural based. I mean, but there's some people then they'll just compare contrast. You know, like you want a dependency Marxist theory, you want a modernization theory. Well, you know, you got these tools, you got these theoretical ways to explain the phenomenon. You know, um, I don't know. Then people pick their theory and then they build on it, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stick with Wallerstein. <laughs> I think that makes sense, especially with this immunization, you know, uh, uh, the development of uh, a lot of the Western countries, including the U.S., were like hoarding a lot of the COVID vaccination. And uh, it was not, you know, the global South, you know, didn't have access to it. So there was a real, that's a real world systems example. You agree or disagree? I don't know on that. Is that fair to say? Well, did, did you say you know? there's, a, there's definitely a hierarchy with the vaccines. I mean, we, yeah. I mean, there's no absolutely no doubt about it because even with a debate about like should we waive the patents, you know, yeah. vaccines, exactly. Um, and you know, and and then it's very interesting because the spokespeople for these pharmaceutical companies are in the uh, yeah they they, they they argue that well you know waiving patents is not going to make a difference because. 
Right. Because uh, it takes a lot of, um, you know, effort and money to, uh, to, to basically produce the vaccine, you know. Because right. it, it's definitely true, like, if you look at the know-how, like, all, like, the places where the factory is located, like the Pfizer BioNTech, BioNTech right. is a German company. They're based in, I think, Frankfurt, Dam- I think. Darmstadt, I think. Or Darmstadt, yeah. I, I, I was, it was, or Mar- Marburg. In Marburg, they have like oh, a. Yeah. Uh, you got, you got it closer system. than I did. I didn't know that. I know um, it was German. A, 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 and then, and then, and then, the, and then Pfizer is the U.S. company, so they have uh, plants in, in, I think, in Michigan and uh, in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore, I think, was Johnson Johnson. I'm not sure, but but definitely there was one, in, uh, yeah. a couple in the U.S. Very good. And. Uh, and so it's those two countries with you know substantial amounts of uh, capital investments uh, in in those in the mRNA vaccine, uh, which is a new technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it's definitely possible to take that know-how and you transfer it to another country with an, a lot of production facilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you look at what's happening in uh, in India, so you have the what's called the the, the Zero Institute, which is uh, based in uh, Pune in Maharashtra. Uh, it's the biggest vaccine producer in the world, right? And oh, wow. uh, and so they they develop two kinds of vaccines. The one is the um, biotech, which is a domestic company, and then and they also produce AstraZeneca um, because. AstraZeneca, which is based in in Sweden and the UK, they were um, they were transferring the license. It, it, it wasn't like giving up the patent, but it was just transferring the license. So they could produce it there, produ- exactly. So you can have produce it there, and that's something that is very much feasible, uh, and I think it should be done with with Pfizer and Moderna because those are the two vaccines i mean if you look at the efficacy trials for those two vaccines that is mrna based uh, i mean it's it's much i mean so i think all of the vaccines are doing a pretty good job at preventing death and like severe cases right. um but then the variation is about like like getting the infection in the first place <laughs> like if you look at i mean the trials and Hear that? <laughs> uh, in in uh, uh, but you know, in Pfizer, like it was like ninety one percent effective, right? Yeah. Which, which is to say that, you know, like if people are coughing, you know, the the, the COVID viral load at you, and you are vaxxed up with uh, with a Pfizer, you know, ninety one percent of the chance you're not going to get the infection at all. But there's still the nine percent, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but then even if you do get, well, then in most cases, the the viral load that's developing in your nasal ph- pharynx is going to be so small. Yeah. That I mean, you, you're probably going to be asymptomatic, and you might not even be shedding the virus uh, to others. So. Um, I got mine, yeah. so I'm good. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we all hope, right? I mean, of course. Yeah. The issue is like, what, what, what about the strains, right? Uh, right, right. Strains possibility well. that, that the new strain will circumvent the. I follow the news in India. It's pretty. It's, it sounds very serious, and death death rates are uh, skyrocketing. So yeah, it's definitely a big problem there. Yeah. But I mean, so yeah. this issue of like vaccines and. So, I would, I would actually there. I I would move away from world systems theory a little bit and move towards this risk society idea from Beck, you know, like uh, there's the boomerang effect. There is this uh, issue of risk distribution. Those that live in urban areas in the cities in poor areas are high risk. And I think they were saying that uh, I was watching the news that there's some of the locations uh, outside of the major uh, cities in India that were also very affected. So it's uh, there's this risk component which, you know, uh, and then the, the whole, I don't know, the governance, you know, there was uh, sometimes there's neglect on behalf of the state, you know, the same thing in Brazil, you know, what happened, not taking it seriously, or the state doesn't, you know, take it as serious, or uh, then it has consequences, right, for the rest of the population. 
So I don't know. I guess you could use a risk risk uh, thesis there, risk theory, risk whatever you want to call it, because it uh, affects you know different people at greater yeah. risk. Not individually. I mean, I mean, as a whole uh, society there, right? Um, so I'm trying to. You could, yeah, you could use the risk society thesis because it 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 it, mean, it it converges together with attitudes, beliefs. You know how the state response responds to it. Um, but what can you do if you're living in a crowded, you know, village or something, or or slum even? You know, once you get it, you get it. So it, I don't know what else could you could do. You could do. You could practice social distancing, and wear a mask. But if you live in a crowded space. Uh, you're just a greater risk, right? Because yeah. So I mean, but then yeah. you know, India has been a crowded place. You know, even last year when the pandemic started, right? So yeah. And, uh, and if you look at the development of COVID cases, I mean, it really exploded uh, around. I would say second half March. Uh, yeah. And then you can definitely see the curve coming up very sharply. Um, yeah. So up until then. You know, up until maybe late February, everything seemed to be going well. And the reason why was because the government distributed the wrong message that herd immunity had already been achieved. You know, that, you know, there's nothing about the virus that we should be concerned about. And at that point, there were two things that were happening, right? So the one is like religious ceremonies, yeah, I heard about that because uh, it's you know, a Hindu country, so they have their uh, you know ceremonies, which usually is about like large people, a large amount of people crowding uh, around, um, you know, usually around like rivers, mm-hmm. um, you know, because there's like this ritual act of washing and self cleansing and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and then the second was that there were regional elections that were happening in. Uh, Oh, wow. I think it has. And, and so, you know, elections in India is always like a spectacle, you know, even much more so than in Western countries because uh, okay, I guess you have so many people and you just bring them, bring the crowds together and uh, you give, you know, election speeches. Uh, and a big part of it actually is donations. Uh, you know, we, we might call this like vote buying, you know, things like that. Where, <laughs> Where you know government officials are promising like you know sacks of rice you know as a gift to the voters yeah. and stuff. I see some uh, of the street food uh, videos in Mumbai where it's just very crowded. Now this is just videos I see, you know, and uh, I could imagine it's high risk. So if somebody gets it, you know, everybody gets it. So so that those are definitely a risk factor. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what's happening now. But then the thing is that. I mean, as I said, you know, India has been a crowded country even last year. But yeah, uh, density, population density, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, but it's, it's not just the population density. I think you have to put the population density together with, you know, other political factors, you know, that okay. basically made, made the Indian government very impatient. You know, they said, well, we have to go back to normal again because, you know, we can't afford to have another lockdown, you know. Um, you know, we have to we have to support the economy. Now, the problem with that logic is that if you don't control the case numbers with infections, they rise again. That, that, well, then the economy will also suffer. You know, it's like, I mean, that, that's always one, that, I mean, this is the debate we've been having for over a year now since the pandemic started. Double-edged sword. <laughs> where it's like, you know, either you save the economy or you save the public health. But then the reality is like, you know, if you don't, if you don't control the case numbers, then the economy will be destroyed anyway, right? Because you know, because because what happens is like you have hospital beds is filling up. You know, you have people that are dying on the streets essentially without oxygen, mm-hmm. and then people are like, "Oh my God, that means I cannot no longer, uh, I no longer dare to go to work." You know, I no longer want to go to the shop. You know, and then of course the whole economy comes down, right? So. So if we you want to save it, the economy, yeah. you're going to have to bring the numbers into control. I think we can call it, this is a textbook example of manufactured risks. You know, it's both 
the, the way that risks are defined, managed, thought of, uh, what are the distinctions that people make? What are, what are the, uh, how much risk are they willing to take? You know, like how does this, how, how is it managed? And it is, I think it's always tied to also human decisions. When humans make decisions, there's some calculation that there's some risk involved. And so that's what, like we're talking about this double-edged sword, you know, like either you open it up or you damage the economy, but it's both interconnected. And so ultimately people make decisions and then you have this dilemma, right? <laughs> the same thing is even in Germany, you know, like they had the same problem. Like on the one hand you had uh, what's playing out in Germany right now, I guess the last few weeks is is like the liberals, the free Democrats, they're all like going this legal direction. They think that, you know, state doesn't have this authority to, to shut us down and they're taking away our civil liberties. And so, and then they do open it up, you know, because the courts give them the right. They're, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we can't lock it. The state can't lock it down. So then they had the numbers go back up. <laughs> right? So then they had to shut it down anyways. So that happened uh, in certain, uh, like I think, uh, Eastern Germany had serious numbers go up. So that's that ambivalence, you know, they, and that risk. That's that manufactured risk idea. I think that works. Because ultimately, it's, it's our decisions, the decisions that are made. And, you know, the, the virus is going to go where it goes. And it doesn't care about laws. It doesn't care about Bill of Rights, right? The virus will just infect and <laughs> carry it on to the next... Yeah, if you consider the, the origins of the virus. Um, yeah. So that's also, that's a pure application of risk society because so mm -hmm. there, there, there's, there's, there's two, you know, hypothesized causes which make a lot of sense, I would say, in the COVID context. So the first, uh, you know, goes back to our ecology discussion, right, which is that, you know, human populations, settlements are expanding mm -hmm. and... That means that we're going to come into contact inevitably with uh, disease carriers in the animal world. So, in the coronavirus case, it would be it would be the bats, mm -hmm. uh, the bats which were hanging out in the caves of Yunnan, right, um, in China, and uh, they they are for them coronavirus is like a reservoir, which means that they don't get sick themselves from coronavirus but they could give it to others and they could make us sick basically mm -hmm. um sort of like a snake like a venom so something like that like a snake has a venom uh or like yeah that, that yeah, can... right i mean it, it's just yeah just hanging around okay that infected species right um is going to be dangerous to to humans mm -hmm. um and the fact that you know our population is expanding for sure our craving for um, resources is endless. So we're going to come into contact, uh, you know, sooner or later, right? Mm. And that's definitely the source, I mean, especially of the first SARS virus, which happened in 2002, 2003. Um, and then now the second thesis, and this is something that's been talked about more re recently, is, uh, is the lab leak hypothesis, which is the idea that uh, th that the coronavirus emerged from the uh, Wuhan lab because uh, they have like the Center for Disease Control lab uh, based in Wuhan and they were doing research on what's called gain of function, which is you, you basically take the bat with the virus and then you you do a bunch of experiments on it. Mm. You, just, you just see, okay, if I change this uh, inside of that cell, uh, of that virus, then you know that feature changes. You know, whatever. Um, and now the thing is that the, that the coronavirus started in Wuhan, right? It didn't start uh, somewhere far out uh, in, in the countryside where a lot of bats were. So, it just out of that, I mean, the, there's a correlation now to say that you know it could have come from the lab. Mm. Now, what's very interesting is that. The WHO team, which was dispatched um, to investigate this issue, um, yeah, of course, I mean, there's not a lot of people who give that WHO investigation a lot of credibility. 
because uh, actually a lot of the scientists um, uh, on um, on the WHO team uh, were themselves participants uh, in the gain of function research. Oh wow! I didn't know that. And, and that's I mean, from a scientist perspective, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for scientists. Yeah. Because if they if they were to say, look, you know, we screwed up, you know, it was, the virus was accidentally leaked from the lab. And I don't think it was on purpose. I don't think anybody would do such a thing on purpose, right? But by accident, it, it, it had leaked out. It would lead to so much public outrage. And conspiracy theories, there. Right? <laughs> yeah, then people would say, well, okay, then we're not, we're going to defund, defund the research. Yeah. I mean, if if you're like a vir- virologist, you know, you, you basically, yeah, it, it's like I mean, if you're a sociologist, you know, like okay, we get department funding, but sometimes you need money from, you know, whatever the NSF or something, right? So um, some outside source, um, and for them, it for the virologists, it would be much worse. That's all their money, yeah. Yeah, if, if people are saying, yeah. yeah, it's like, hey, we, we're going to shut down this whole research program. Um, because because you know, damned if they do, damned if they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I I have full sympathy for the from the scientist perspective. I mean, I think so. My, my view is, I think you know, it's okay to continue the gain of function research. I mean, I think what should be done is people should think about how how do you how do you improve the safety protocol, right? Like, how do you make sure that that's that, that, that you don't laugh, uh, that you don't leak. You know. Larry, you strike a chord. That's exactly the uh, point that Beck made in Risk Society when he wrote it, 1986, uh, in reflection of uh, Chernobyl, that our human senses that we used to use to, you know, connect to what is good, what is bad, we used to use our human senses, you know, and now we rely on expert systems. Now we rely on you know very sophisticated technology. And there are some things that is you we don't often know, and that's where the risks come in. You know, I think that makes sense if you think about like uh, we really entered a, a phase, I guess, in the 21st century, where there are a lot of unknowns and there are a lot of side effects to things. And it's all around us, you know, what we eat, the plastics, the genetically modified foods, the, you know, uh, it's all around us. So I don't, I'm not saying it's, you know, we can't do anything about it, but I think the idea is maybe to reduce uh, risks and to have some knowledge about what's happening uh, and what impact social institutions play, including the state, you know, and other institutions, you know, I mean, they play a big role. But with Chernobyl disaster, that was clearly an example. It was a, it was a failure of both the, you know, the, the state to acknowledge it, you know, and then it was, uh, I guess, the plant managers. If you really have time, I recommend watching the Chernobyl TV series uh, HBO uh, had a f- two, three years ago. And they were trying to, like, look at all the different aspects, all the different failures of why Chernobyl, you know, became you know, the Chernobyl disaster. And um, perfect. I mean, as far as the theory, risk society, it's a manufactured risk, just like Fukushima is was. You know, they're manufactured. Uh, they're you can't blame it on natural risks. There really are. Also, like the, there's this book uh, in the late '70s by uh, Charles Perrault. Okay, he's a former a sociologist, and uh, it was called I think the normal accident. Okay. And uh, and so he, he uh, in the in the beginning chapters he I think he uses the example of the uh, accident at Three Mile Island. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, back in yeah, nineteen seventy nine or something, and yeah. um, that was so around the nineteen sixties the U.S. began to uh, you know open up Bobal, India. <laughs> yeah, n- nuclear. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not familiar with that case, but uh, n- yeah, nuclear. Energy was sort of jump started, and um, and after that accident in seventy nine, the Three Mile Island, um, you know, a lot of states became more skeptical about uh, adding more power plants, 
is actually if you look at the the numbers um you know nuclear energy still produces a big portion i would say maybe at least a fifth of all the us energy uh but uh but it's been stagnant since the mid 1980s um because uh it might even be still more declining because you have old plants that are being shut down and then you know and then new ones are not being uh put in operation um so and you know and you could argue that you know that the 79 incident was uh a major yeah. turning point you know to sort of make officials aware that uh, maybe did they ever have problems in austria state. with a nuclear power plant i can't remember in the 80s did they have does uh, austria even have nuclear power plant i think they have one or two right? no the answer is no so oh, you'll have, oh, in 1978 uh, the government at that time, uh, Bruno Kreisky was the chancellor, uh, and uh, he wanted to create nuclear power plants because you know he saw, okay, you know, look at what's happening in Germany and in France, and they have these power plants and it works well, etc. And there was a large protest oh. uh, hmm. by the population that was, uh, you know, organizing against, um, you know, is it Zwentendorf is the village uh, name. It's a little bit outside of Vienna, and um, yeah, and people were uh, were protesting against the nuclear power plant, and then what happened was the government uh, then did a referendum. Oh, uh, and then the referendum, uh, the majority voted against uh, against uh, the nuclear plant. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, so since then, you know, there, there's been. I mean, like sometimes you know the Conservative Party brings it up again, but hmm. uh, but yeah, but it's it's not deeply divisive as a, as an issue, right? Yeah. I mean, right. in part because like you know the country already has like you know hydropower, which is a huge source of uh, energy, um, and solar too, right? A little bit of solar on the roofs, on the houses. Solar is increasing. Yeah. Uh, wind is increasing, but you know, yeah. gas. You know, gas is a big thing, obviously. Yeah, which is why it's important for the Austrian government to have good relations with Putin, right? Uh, okay. Because because uh, Putin is <laughs> is the deliverer of the of the gas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but huh. but in any case, yeah. Um, about risk society, yeah, there's another example I want to bring up. You know, uh, Shana Swan. Uh, she's a, a medical doctor researcher, I think, in uh, in New York, and. Uh, because you mentioned plastic, right? Uh, and she said so she did some research uh, on the effects that plastic use has on sperm count. Oh no, it goes down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it goes down. I mean, it's mean, and it's very interesting because uh, because because so, so she you know aggregated data for maybe the last twenty years or so. Yeah. And what's very interesting is that you know, the average sperm count. I mean. It's like a straight line down. I mean, it's, like it's it's not like it goes down and stabilizes. Yeah. It's like a straight line down. So, you could do the extrapolation that by, I would say, middle of century, uh, we are we are basically going to be infertile, completely. Wow. Um, and and it's also very interesting at what stage. So, you know, maybe you and I, you know, we might still be able to reproduce, but because uh, you know of our age. Mm. Uh, the the crucial stage is like the the fetal stage. So basically, you know, pregnant um, women uh, that are exposed to uh, you know chemical um, compounds uh, just by I don't know using hair care products or things like that, right? uh-huh. uh, or just handling plastic in some way. Um, and you know that that effect. So if you know f- for for the male offspring, uh, it, it affects the yeah the production of sperm negatively. That's real effect on our biological organism, yeah, or our bodies. Let's put it that way, our bodies. Sperm, yeah. yeah. So I mean, th- th- that's also one of these interesting things in risk society that you, we should think about, right? Which is yeah. again to bring it back full circle to demography. I mean, you, you see that there's an increase in yeah, very good. Uh, in in vitro fertilization, right? Yeah. Um, IVF treatments. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I knew a scholar from uh, she was at NYU who was doing research on uh, egg freezing, um, oh. which is you know 
Okay, so that's that's slightly different from in vitro, but now I, I, actually it's related, I would say, because because so basically what's happening is you have women in their early thirties and they you know they freeze eggs, hmm. and then I guess the idea is like if they want to get pregnant that they would basically pull it out of the freezer and no way you know, lost that because it is so because well, it is definitely the case that like you know as a woman gets older that. The, the the air quality decreases right so uh, and then you're going to have problems with like you know conception and you know the likelihood of uh, down syndrome and, and you know other other disabilities of the child um and uh yeah so egg freezing is a big thing in vitro fertilization is a big thing um and it's going to grow in importance and i think part of the reason is because of the you know, plastic induced uh you know sperm reduction right um and 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 also because of the social trends that we just talked about right which is you know mm. economic insecurity women wanting to work longer you know not wanting to settle down too early right well i guess if you're looking at it through a demographic lens you're right fertility count and uh, uh, all of the ways it affects it, like like you said, you know, risks with new technologies and uh, that affects uh, sperm count. And uh, but ultimately, with demography, like there's these three factors, you know, that we know impact population growth, right? I think I remember I had this in the book: fertility, mortality, and migration. You know. If there's any more, let me know. <laughs> but if any of those get directly impacted, then you have a change in the population. You go, oh, oh, you know, that's why you have those age sex pyramids. Uh, and I've just seen those, right? The age sex pyramids, how they look yeah, like. Yeah, they look yeah. like. So if you have a poor country, it, it looks very broad on the base. So the fertility count is very uh, huge. It may be 6.7 kids per, you know, a mother will have in a country like Chad right in uh, japan the fertility count is only 1.3 i think just pulling it on top of my head so they have a problem of you know not enough young babies right and too many elderly right so any of those can have impacted both fertility rates the mortality rates and the migration in or out of the country too you know so all those three, unless there's more, maybe there's environmental factors we, well, that we haven't considered that in, impact population structure. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, those it, three, it, I think those three, I think those three are the core. The ecology would impact the population. Yeah. yeah. One of these three mechanisms that you just mentioned, right? Biological anyways, yeah. Or environmental, yeah. Things. Yeah, so I mean, in the case of like the plastic and the sperm count, um, you know, the fertility will go down. That's uh, yeah. And I mean, how the rates would go up over time. You think it would uh, uh, have effect on life expectancy too? Like with the, uh, I know that they're saying that it, our life expectancy is going to keep going up in Western countries. You know, the, the males, the women will outlive the males by four or five years. That's usually the average, but but they will keep going up. The idea is, unless there's an exception with the U.S., though, the, I think they were saying that uh, with suicides, uh, the life expectancy starts to go down a little bit in the US. It doesn't go up, you know, compared to other countries. Like it's 82 in Canada for uh, males. And I think it's 78 for males in the US. So slight difference. Germany is about- Because well, you have the inequality that you have to face. Yeah. Right? Because- Healthcare systems and all yeah, that. Canadian healthcare system is a lot better. So then- if, 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 because if you take if you take care of like the average you know lower middle class and the poor person, then that that will drag up the the number right the average number. Because now here over here it's like, you know okay you know Bill Gates and you know like War well Bill Gates is a slightly young guy but like, but Warren Buffett you know like Charlie 80, Munger you know eighty three eighty four like in his nineties now I think oh his nineties yeah. Uh, and I mean, Warren Buffett is like ninety one I think this year. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, the upper classes usually. Yeah, it's like that, that, that. Yeah, those people. I mean, they're gonna do well. I mean, they, they have the best healthcare in the world, right? Um, and huh. yeah, but it's inequality, right? Where our healthcare system isn't good enough to support like the sort of poor population. And dental care. 
uh, are, yeah. you know how bad it is dental care yeah yeah like uh, and, and of course you know there's this argument by um uh wilkinson and pickett uh where they say you know the more unequal a society is uh, the more social problems it will have i mean uh, it means you know much higher rates of obesity much higher crime rate uh um you know yeah, much worse health outcomes, you know, lower life expectancy, things like that. Um, and uh, so we have two researchers at Princeton. Um, wow. A, c- a case in Deaton. Um, and Angus Deaton was, this was a guy who got the Nobel Prize. Oh, wow. Uh, for, economist or sociologist? <laughs> was an econ- economist. He's an health economist. Okay. But, uh, I mean, but, but he, like, he, he didn't do any, like, fancy statistics or modeling. I mean, he just did like straight up um you know descriptive graphs of uh yeah. reality trends uh, over time uh in the US and you know you basically so so he says the main gradient um of what determines life expectancy is a college degree so if you have a bachelor's degree or higher then uh, your life expectancy on average continues going up. Mm. And actually, very much in line with uh, the other countries like Canada, Japan, European countries. Um, but you know, if you have anything less than that, so it's high school, high school, and less, um, then then your mortality is going up, uh, and it started wow. to happen around like late nineties, early two thousands. Um, which is very interesting because if you remember, like, in, well, we were too young back then, but in the 90s, uh, there was like the booming economy, right? The internet economy, everything is going to be different because people are going to be hooked up to the internet, right? Technological change, economic growth, blah, blah, blah. You know, while all of this happening, and right at that tail end, you know, you start seeing the, um, the numbers and in mortality increasing. Or suicide too, right? Suicide goes up a little bit. Yeah, that's of course directly tied to that, right? So, because yeah. the way how you increase the mortality rate uh, is usually by, yeah, it's basically premature death. Mm-hmm. And the way how premature death happens, I mean, the two most common ways to do it. Uh, well, the three most common ways is alcohol and drugs, uh, and obesity. Right? Yeah, obesity. And, well, obesity is still a long-term thing, um, you know. And there, of course, is another big problem that we have to deal with that too. Um, but it, obesity is a gradual thing. I mean, like the thing that drove the mortality rate for the lesser-educated men mm-hmm. the last twenty years uh, is, is uh, you know, you know, gun suicides usually or. Uh, but but more, most most common it was like alcohol and and hard drugs. Yeah, we should see guns as a public health problem. I think we need to look at it that way, especially in the U.S. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the fact that it's too easy to access the guns, you know. Yeah, I'm with you there. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, this is yeah this is another risk that we basically are imposing on. on See, that's the culture, right? That's the political culture in this country, right? Right? Think about the 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 idea of uh, uh, something like that. If you compare it to Europe, I mean, they have suicides. We don't have gun related suicides like we do here, you know, right? Well, there's uh, I think in Switzerland, there's a little bit more than that because. Because they have, you know, like they have like mandatory military duty, yeah, and uh, and then they would, you know, and then a lot of people would would have guns, would have handguns okay. at home, hmm. and um, interesting, yeah. But they, but but you know, like Switzerland, they don't have like, you know, mass shooting deaths, you know, things like that. Yeah. You yeah. know, the, the, the crazy stuff that you see here almost every day now. I mean, I know it's crazy. Um, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, 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 yeah, so there's a lot of you know, social issues that, that come out of, you know, uh, gun violence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, but yeah, there, there, was, there was actually like an earlier point that I wanted to go back to because yeah, um, it's about um, 
the the the, the pygmies again, um, which is as I said, the first point about you know why they um, you know were integrated into market society um, was because you know they were evicted from the land. But then another reason, even without you know considering that eviction, which is very important, uh, is because they they dispatch some of the younger people, younger members of the tribe, to go down to the next larger village, to usually a Bantu village. Uh, and, uh, and and then they would start working there. And they'd be starting to be paid a wage. And then, and then that's very interesting because that's what changes the mentality of the people. Because what happens is that the people who who earn the wage, okay, they start buying things. Yeah. They start buying material things, and then what happens is they bring it back to the village, and they're like, "Hey, look at this cool gadget that I have." Yeah. And now you see, there's this always a thing where, like, if you were completely ignoramus, right? Meaning, like, you don't know that the device that a piece of technology exists, you know, then you don't have any craving for it, right? It's only like somebody comes to you, you know, like if you go to like your Apple store or whatever, you know, and then that, 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 that salesman is starting to, you know, whip out the, the new phone, right? <laughs> and then and then show you the features, right? The cool features in it. Uh, and then you're like, oh my God, I need to have that shit, you know? Um, so it makes sense, yeah. Uh I mean they get exposed to a different economy form and the agricultural life or uh was different from the this capitalist kind of life you get money this has value you can purchase something with it uh i guess it's like a process yeah so what you're saying is like in rural areas then they 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 actually work in the city or something and then they then it, it changes their outlook on economics too, where they, they see uh, money and currency. Maybe they didn't have money and currency when they were you know, in a rural area or something. It wasn't such a value. Money didn't have the same value. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, kind exactly. Of? Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, 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 you're, if you're a completely tribal village, you're, you're, lit- you're off, off the grid, as you call it, right? I mean... Yeah, which, which means like you, you don't need any currency to survive because because you 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 only have to think about the things that is there for your immediate survival. Yeah. So you have to you know think about okay, I'm gonna kill this animal right uh, to cook it up for food. You know, I'm gonna collect these berries. You know, and I'm gonna uh, yeah. you know create this tent with this material. You know. Uh, so so but w- once you fixed up those things, you know. You actually don't need anything else, right? Um, Just basic subsist- subsistence is covered. Your subsistence is then in that in that world in that in that village. That's the way of life, right? That's the way. Also, how you live your life, cultural. Yeah, that's that's a way of life, and uh, and it's not been adulterated by money and by uh, what it uh, by commitment to the abstract. Gertz, Gertz called that cultural scripts. You know, uh, in some par- parts of the world, I think he did Indonesia, Java, and uh, why cockfighting is so big in the rural places. Uh, he explained it through this idea of cultural scripts uh, that are important in that culture, but they may not have the same relevance in other cultures, like cockfighting. You know, I mean, we don't really have that is well we have dog fighting i guess in the u.s and boxing it comes close if you want to call it close but there's different cultural scripts that play out in different uh you know places where people live and cohabit yeah that makes sense <clears throat> yeah i think yeah, it makes yeah. sense your argument it makes perfect sense yeah so then you're saying that those people they they uh get exposed to some different uh cultural script or different value system and then they start to find this more, more appealing than their rural lifestyle for instance right yeah something like that that, that, that that's that's what's happening yeah absolutely yeah. i mean and so that's a, that's the reason why 
like so you know you can be optimist or pessimist you know in some sense uh you can be marxist or barbarian because i mean recall so in the marxist perspective um yeah there is some degree of volunteerism right M meaning that that volunteerism is the idea that you know humans can change the world you know by agency. enacting certain, yeah I mean, they have agency right that's the argument uh and you know and and the social force that's endowed with the agency is the working class. That's sort of like the really standard orthodox Marxist argument, especially in the early period, like 1840. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the 1840s, I mean, if you read the Marxian writings, I mean, you could sense that he was a real optimist. Um, but um, actually, in the later writings, you don't, you don't see it as much. Um, you know, with Weber, Weber is like full scale pessimist. <laughs> I mean, where, where do you start? The Protestant ethic, spirit of capitalism, or you start with <laughs> rationalization of the oral, or where do you go? Yeah, yeah, yeah everything. So, <laughs> everything. I mean, of course, like the main statement is in the Protestant work ethic. Right, okay. You had this, uh, uh, you had this metaphor to the, the Eisenes Gehäuse, right? Stellan's yeah. Gehäuse, right? Which is like the, the iron cage. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, and the whole idea is that so yeah. like he, he says like at the beginning there are some people who became uh, Protestants um, in a in a capitalistic sense you know meaning like you know work hard save money and things like that uh, you know prove your worth to God uh, and then what happens over time is that that view becomes the only acceptable one that anybody who has a different vision mm -hmm. is like it's not me you know like they don't get killed but they just get absorbed yeah so i mean go back to the pygmy example right i like guess as soon as you have some people from that village you know who you know who use the money that they earn to buy material things and then show it to the other villagers they're like, hey, you know, look at this cool thing. And then the moment the other villagers are convinced that thing is really cool. You can hedge our money, right? Cultural that, imperialism. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how it works. That, that's, you get absorbed into that system. Yeah. And it's like, and, f and for us, it's the most abstract thing to sort of recognize that because cause, cause we grew up in that system, right? It's like there, was, there wasn't anything... Like nobody can, ever came up to you and said, "Hey, you know, wh why don't you live a hunter gatherer lifestyle for, you know, two <laughs> years or so?" Right? Isn't that this idea of uh, embeddedness uh, that uh, Polanyi always talks about? We're always we're already embedded, you know, uh, and everything is already embedded through culture, and that's it's 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 byproduct of both the economic system and the culture. I think that's what Weber is trying to do with the Protestant ethic idea. He wants to like show that the Protestant worldview uh, shapes and then influences the development of modern capitalism. This whole idea of calling, money making, you know, think of Benjamin Franklin. I mean, I mean, it just becomes like it's an, an ideology or religion. If you want to go that far, you know, uh, it, it converges together, I guess, you know, Berufspflicht. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah the you have to work. Is, right. I don't know. I could. Be, maybe. Maybe I'm uh, going too far. But let's think of how r resonating to this day the meritocratic idea is, the bootstrap ideology. Think of how that is not challenged. It's, many people still believe it. They're convinced that you know hard work is a way forward, and it's it's manifested in in business and i don't know in thinking even this cryptocurrency stuff think about it there's people that are really thinking that's good money making is good right make more right. maybe I'm hard work fall. should be rewarded basically right. by eliminating inflation speculation. <laughs> right yeah um you know um, i have this german book i'm going to recommend uh, i think i told you this i don't know where it is uh, 
Sickard Neckel, he had he had another book he wrote. It was oh, Flucht nach vorn. Flucht nach vorn. It's this, uh, if you translated it from German into English, it's like this pressure to go forward. Yeah. Like Flucht nach vorn means like this escape, cultural escape, emphasis. Escape that, forward, yeah. You have to go forward. Whatever it is, you got to go forward. And I think it, uh, it, it kind of goes out of, comes from this Protestant idea, but it starts to, you know, expand uh, in business culture, you know, money making, things like that. So, so I mean, I, I guess like you're, it's like a neo Weberian, I guess, worldview. Go ahead. I mean, to bring this back to this climate change thing, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If, for instance, <laughs> if you have, you know, uh, you know, climate catastrophe, or if you have some resource scarcity, how, the way you deal with it is, you know, you find a new resource, and hopefully that that resource is going to be less uh, as a s- small environmental impact, right? Um, and that's that would be an escape forward, right? It, like it, it's in a sense like, or you know the example that I used in my blog post uh, with the space colonization. And, yeah, I got it. I got the table here. I wrote it down. Uh, uh, Musk Do you think that's a realistic uh, alternative, a space uh, colonization? You really? I was thinking I could I could understand eco socialism, but did you really say that space colonization would? would be yeah better... so, actually, so whether or, it's real yeah. is it is it feasible with current technology the answer is no um yeah. is it feasible you know it, as human civilization continues to evolve yeah uh it is feasible i would say okay um but but the larger point that i was making here in this blog post was that the space colonizers they don't want to change the social system. Right. So that's your that's your flucht nach vorne. Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> they don't want yeah, to it's a way of saying, you know, I, I I know that nature is trying to impose a constraint upon humans, but I don't want to abide by these constraints. I'm just going to jump over it. Yeah. Right. So like, imagine so the way how our capitalist economy works is think of it as you know, like a really fast train, like a, you know, like a bullet train, right? Right. And then with every, like, percentage point of economic growth, you know, like, it, it, it goes faster and faster, right? Now, the thing is that if you wanted to reduce accidents, which, of course, all of us, you know, is invested in, you know, we don't want to, you know destroy this planet for future generations you know we don't want to you know develop like COVID times three you know all these other things so we want to reduce the risk now of course logically the easiest way to reduce the risk is if you slow down the train and what that means is you know shrink the economy right yeah no economy then all the all of the risk factors that we have uh, with the climate growth Degrowth. Okay. Yeah, exactly. With uh, w- you know, with pandemics, all right. Uh, with uh, social, you know, social struggles, you know, all of that, you know, would come down. Uh, uh, and, me... but that's not what the Musk Bezos. You know, they don't talk about that stuff. You know, what they're saying is, I'm going to tell you how we yeah. can safely accelerate the train. All right. Yeah. Let me briefly uh, repeat your little graph and, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Because I wrote it down and you had three scenarios. One was status quo, and I assume that's conservative. And you said that th- that will likely not change the social structure if we maintain the status quo like we have it now. Then you say also for status quo, it will not change in technology. And then you say that the chance for human survival for this kind of mode, maintaining the status quo is low. Then the second one you have is eco-socialism. That's the second one I wrote down. There you say that the, the, the social structure could change if we adopt this eco-socialism. Uh, and we have to define it briefly. So you said eco-socialism is like an egalitarian distribution of income and wealth. Did I get it right? Yes. So pretty good? Okay. And then I guess that also means egalitarian distribution of pollution. 
Can we throw that in there too? Is that okay? Or would you have a problem with that? No. Is that not eco social? I, 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 no, it makes sense. It makes okay. sense. And I mean, ultimately, like the goal is, mm -hmm. is to reduce the overall level of pollution that, right. that you made. I mean, so I'm building this argument of, of Peter Frace, which is. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, uh, then you have this, you think change, but the technology, you think that it, with eco socialism, it would not change. I would probably maybe have a different view. I think that with, when you think of, um, let's say, green Keynesianism, you, you could force a change in the capitalist technology into something uh, that uh, takes the environment into, into a, its factor of production. So I think you could, you could force it, like, like with green Keynesianism or state kind of regulation, you could, like with Dolzenpfund, you know, in Germany, uh, you could force, like, it, it's like a hidden tax, I guess, you have to pay for it. And then it then you, you get money back if you do recycle it. But so it forces a different behavior. I don't know if it, it does change the technology, because it forces the uh, uh, supermarkets to change their like use of plastic, uh, they have to I know in German grocery stores, they sometimes have to use more glass or recyclable. I went to Ikea yesterday, I don't know if you have one. In, you have IKEA in uh, Princeton. They oh, now yeah, understand. they yeah. have. You go to IKEA. They don't like you go to their uh, cafeteria. Uh, they have wooden spoons that they give you, and you know it's a Swedish company, but it's a kind of eco mentality. Well, is it is it reusable and washable? Uh, I've got it in my car, but it's it's degradable, biodegradable. <laughs> And I was like, wow, they're really, they're really pushing it with Ikea. You would never see that. I mean, and you go to any, you know, fast food restaurant here, it's all plastic, you know. Uh, but I, at least they're trying, you know. I think it's hats off to Ikea. But I think, I think you could. I think you could uh, with eco-socialism, you, you could uh, with regulation, the state implements, you know, maybe at first voluntary, it could be strictly, and then, and then you could make it, a law like they did in Germany, you know, like, like you forced, forced people to recycle, you know, like, and I, again, it would be something that American exceptionalism, you know, it'd be hard to overcome. And there will be some people that will just not do it. But uh, the other yeah, one, so, I mean, brought, my, my argument yeah. is, isn't to say that, oh. uh, that there shouldn't be any technological changes at all. It's, it's rather to say that in order for eco socialism to be sustainable for human survival, mm -hmm. You 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 shouldn't have to change too much in the technology. Um, you know you should be you should be able to like you don't have to be basically be a rocket scientist, uh, in the sense of like developing unknown technologies in order to save the planet. Yeah. Uh, you know, it should, like if you if you produce and consume less. That would do that, it. That, that, that's yeah, right. They would, they would do it. Would there be a necessary? Necess, nece, would it be necessary to ban some technologies, though? Ultimately, like I mean, you'd have to, like you would have to, one day. I mean, if you wanted to go really ecological, they'll have to ban plastic uh, in some areas of production. That might be too far, but that that, that would be the state. You know, the state would have to say. You know, we have to. If you did it voluntarily, I don't know if the companies would do it. They might, but like IKEA did it, I guess. But I don't know what other. Uh, I don't know in Northeast uh, if there are states that they have laws where they don't allow plastics, like bags. Do they still have that? <laughs> well, I mean, we have or, plastic bags everywhere around. Here, oh so yeah, <laughs> sure. is, I mean, if if it's implemented, some it's probably in California or something, right? Yeah, it would be the state that would do it uh, first. So. I like I like the way you wrote it out on your table. I was really I like the way. I just maybe I would go further with eco socialism. Like, would you uh, state centered kind of eco socialism or more of a autonomous, uh, not so much state focus? Uh, so I, I would make the argument that state focus is important because yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, because so. So here's my assumption, and this is just b based on mm. reading of, of Marx, Weber, and these other things, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that, you know, as, as long as you have private property, right, um, there's going to be a need to grow. 
because you know each of these private actors is, is fighting for you know an extra piece of the pie mm-hmm. you know and then now the thing so you know if you don't want to cannibalize the whole society in the process you basically have to grow the pie right because every everybody can have the piece that they currently have and then a little bit more right now if the assumption however with eco socialism is that if we get rid of that growth compulsion mm-hmm. then yeah well then if you keep the private property you know in distribution um then we're going to have zero sum conflicts. I mean, we already see that to some extent because you know we just mentioned demographic challenges, like the decline in aging mm-hmm. societies, um, and you know, like if you look at really old societies, like in Japan, like they don't have Silicon Valley, right? Like they don't have like innovation and all these things happening. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's fundamentally a very now conservative society. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do Japanese capitalists survive? Well, first, it's about stimulus from the government. Yeah. You know, government debt to GDP is like 250%. Uh, but there's limits to that. So then what they do is they they, they concentrate, right? So there's like mergers, acquisitions, you know, like this... You know, bigger companies swallow smaller companies, and then, and then if you put together these efficiencies, then I think you know the capital can sustain itself. Hmm. Um. So we are, but then there's some, but then the disintegration in society just continues. Yeah, because you know you're gonna have you know, people that can no longer find work or, you know, if they find work, then it's just insecure. And so that pushes down the fertility further. And then that was, of course, the original cause for the economic stagnation. So, yeah, I mean, it can, it can be very, it can be a very painful process. And so... That's where uh, automation also has a negative effect, right? Automation, uh, it, could, it could be used as a way you could tax it and then you justify basic income. I think, you know, just get robots to do all the dirty work and then have some kind of tax on the automation that goes and pays the uh, basic income guarantee for, you know, citizens or something. I don't know if you could do that in Japan, but you have a smaller population, you know, uh, I guess with 300 million, it's a little more challenging, but like, um, or in some do indirect subsidies. You know, some kind of indirect subsidy mechanism uh, that pays you to be a citizen. <laughs> you know, uh, you kind of have that. You have that somewhat already in Germany. Like you have this, I don't know, well, hard sphere, hard spheres, and exactly the model system. But, but like Kindergeld, you know, <laughs> you, you get uh, 150 euros per month per child uh, that's paid to the mother until the child reaches the age of 18. Uh, so that's a kind of Keynesianism, but it's a. I don't know what you would label it. It's 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 a it's it's a program, so it's a real. It's public. a subsidy to to raise children, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, fertility. I mean, uh, to increase to stabilize fertility. That's the intended goal. That's but, the intended goal. I mean, it doesn't yeah. always work out. Uh, yeah. That's really Manif- yeah. yeah. Manifest latent function, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it's always better than nothing, but yeah. So, um, because you know, like there's countries like Sweden and France, they were cited as the main examples for successful pronatalist policies. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, I mean, if you look at the most recent numbers, I mean, even they are below replacement rate. It's slightly below replacement rate now. Yeah. Uh, you still have higher than in like the really low fertility countries like Spain and Italy. Um, Denmark too, right? Yeah, Denmark. Denmark, Denmark is yeah. Denmark is also yeah, yeah. higher end. You know, Austria, uh, Germany, they're at the, at the lower end, I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, Poland is now also quite low. Uh, so even with all the rest- restrictions on abortion, right? So, yeah. um, the, the you know, the whole trend is to its, yeah, less uh, 
less of fertility. But I mean, but so the point about basic income, you know, does it make sense in the context of technology? Um, yeah, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, you know, now the people who are automation skeptics, you know, they're making the argument that, you know, this is something that, you know, we don't have to deal with right now, as of now, um, because, because, you know, there's still labor shortages. I mean, we saw with the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, the worst affected sector was um, retail and hospitality. Mm-hmm. Hotels? Yeah. All the hotels, yeah, they were closing down or whatever. And, uh, and now that the economy is starting to come back up again, so, you know, people start traveling, people start going to the theaters and restaurants and, and so forth. And what that does is over the short term, there's going to be adjustment problems because a lot of businesses that were shuttered for such a long time starting to come back up again because, you know, there's a pent up demand because people want to go use these services. Um, and then you're going to have a labor shortage now um, in, in those industries that are coming back up again. Um, and uh, and then some people say in the conservative right, they say, well, it's because the unemployment benefit is so generous, right? Uh, uh, you know, we're subsidizing people to stay home. And that, that means that, you know, uh, the, the, the UBI is, is a bad proposal because it would make people lazy, right? Uh, that's the argument. Well, we have a leisure society, then we'll transform into a leisure society, right? <laughs> yeah, and I would say that basically... Right to be coming, lazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, like the, the, the brutal honesty, I think, um, I would say that basic income should ease people into leisure society. It should... Um, but I mean, it's important to say, like, leisure society does not necessarily mean that that people don't do any work. I mean, work in a, like, meaning useful to other people, you know, it can be anything, right? Uh, it can be, you know, Care. yeah, it can be tutoring kids, right? Uh, without charging for it, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. And that, you know, the Germans call it Gemeinwohlökonomie, right? Like the common benefits, common welfare, oh. Uh, economic I that one up. <laughs> um, mind war economy. Okay. Mind war economy. Uh, um, or Arbeitsmedizin. <laughs> in mind war. Yeah, these are all interesting. Yeah, the, 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 the Germans are very great with language because they they always put two or three different wor- words into one. Yeah. And so that, that, that that's I still a, remember my university days in Germany and the words that they used are just. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, it was putting things together, right? Like, yeah, two two countries. They have different words. grammar rules too, with which letters can be written big or small. I'm sure you know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, but but anyway, so the mind yeah. economy. I mean, that that's an interesting. Yeah. Uh, principle. I mean, but, but but the whole idea being that, you know, I, I I should be able to benefit another person without charging money for it. And and that that's a huge going to be a huge game changer because that's how you can lower the cost of living, right? You 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 lower the influence of the market. Yeah, decommodify. Yeah. Decommodification. And there's always two ways. Don't forget, there's always two ways how you do decommodification, right? You know, you can either pay money so that the person can buy things on the market. That's the UBI model. Uh, and then the other way is you provide services for free, right? So it's, it was it's one of these two things that would have to be done. And uh, we uh, talked about this before. What was it? Uh, the actually public schools could be seen as a kind of uh, parallel welfare state, something like that. I can't remember what we talked about. It was a couple of podcasts before. But some it was the last. Two, one, it was the last one was Dennis. Uh, oh, it was Dennis. And, and no, we, we talked we about it. We were like, we were talking about um, even prisons. Uh, uh, are there's a penal welfare? A penal the state organizes a penal welfare institution. But you know, if make a school money in public school, it's 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 also a, a service for people, public. 
especially working class people, working class parents, right? They get benefits from um, public school system, but people don't see it that way. People don't see the education system in that way. They think it's just learning, you know, uh, knowledge, but they don't see it as an institution that benefits also working class people, right? The buildings, the institution, the, the, the reduced lunch, you know, stuff like that. Gym, playground, I mean, all that's a facility. It's a real use. I guess yeah, the, uh, the schools are a huge part of the wealth. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, so I, so my philosophy is heavily driven by Randy Collins. I mean, I just put yeah, this yeah. out there. And, yeah, of course. Uh, I, you know, I got a lot of his books. <laughs> He's a good, go ahead, Randall Collins. Uh, in, in his doctoral thesis, I mean, he's basically arguing that, you know, college education is a way to, you, know, it's, you could say it's warehouse the population to some extent, you know, draw them out of the labor market, you know, give them sort of like a safe space. Uh, outside the labor market, reserve um, army of academics. Huh? <laughs> um, yeah, something and, like that. And and yeah, I mean, and it gives him a gives him a job for sure. I mean, yeah. credentials. Um, yeah, yeah. By 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 the society requiring the acquisition of credentials, um, you know, r- rather than. Yeah, you know, r- rather than like a skill, you know, because that's that's the that's the opposite argument, right? That that. Schools are there to provide the skills that people need to work, right? Um, and if you assume that this is, if you relax to the assumption, you know, if you don't assume that this is what schools are, are doing at all, uh, you know, what, what schools are doing is they're they are socializing the people into, into society. You know, I mean, you know, you could say primary and secondary schools perform that function, and then you'd have to find a justification for tertiary education. Um, and, you know, here it's about, I don't know, it's, yeah, warehousing, entertainment, um, you know, signaling to employers that, you know, you are a patient person, you know, who has grit, you know, who's willing to study and do homework and things like that. Yeah. Um, and. So the way how I analyze it is that the edu- the education welfare function is going to increase with a function of time, mm-hmm. you know. And what's the proof of that statement? Well, like you know, once an employer requires you to have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or even a PhD to get started. Has it ever happened that they rescind that increased requirement? Mm-hmm. You know, exactly, right? It's like it never happened that, like, you know, today I demand a BA and then tomorrow in high school is okay, right? There's one exception in uh, uh, trucking industry. Only if it's really needed, they'll, you know, they'll cut some corners, like CDL instruction for trucking companies. But I don't know about nursing. I think sometimes they'll speed it up. Mm-hmm. They'll speed it up sometimes, like if it's really, I don't know about every state, but I know there was a situation with teacher shortage in Texas, and they uh, would shorten the certification requirement, and it would like be very quick. It wouldn't be you know like a year, maybe it'd be three months, six months plus internship. But every state, if it has a high demand, they may sometimes bend the corners, bend the rules. So yeah, sometimes, but you're right. Most of the time they, they keep the credential requirement and it, it, they stack more on it, you know? Uh, even, even in, in uh, like family therapists here in Texas, they uh, have to get special certification to practice that. Uh, and I'm sure in other states, it's similar. I don't know your state, but, but like they add, yeah, you're right. I mean, they'll just keep adding more credential requirements. Like they, they say, you need more, you know, you need another credential. Um, uh, so I think with teacher certification, it's usually like just for a year or two, and then you got to redo it. And you got to pay more money. And you, the, they they may ask you to take uh, more exams. Yeah, and they have alternative certification system, which means they they'll use that as a way to get people in, but it's it's very temporary. And it's you know they 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 may not give you the certificate. It's just one year like temporary certification. That's just say to Texas. I don't know about other states. Does that make sense? 
sort of. Yeah. So, so like they have they have some like sometimes when it's really bad, like I guess with teacher shortage, they'll um, they'll have these temporary certificates that they'll hand out, and they were only good for a year, and then and then they you know they're no longer good. So then those people got to get a credential again. <laughs> they got to get the Texas certification to teach in K through twelve specialized subjects. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, that that's going to just become much, yeah. much more important over time, and um, you know, so that's how I like, you know, the Biden administration, as I said, you know, they were putting, they were plowing lots of money now into higher ed and into um, you know, healthcare, your know, nursing homes, and things like that, and it it is undoubtedly true, I think, that education and healthcare is are sectors where we want people to be around. You know, like, you know, if you ask like an elderly relative whether they want, you know, to be taken care of by a robot, I think a lot of them were still skeptical. I mean, I guess yeah. they do it if they have to, but, you know, um, you know, it's better to, to be cared for by humans. I mean, the same thing with instruction and teaching, you know, um, you know, we see that people are frustrated by using Zoom uh, for this past year. And, uh, you know, people are eager to go back to in-person learning. Mm-hmm. And I think then with in-person learning is, you know, you're going to get more attention to each child. But um, but you but you are going to have the economies of scale, right? Like you're not going to be cramming 100 people into, like, you know, into the Zoom window, right? Yeah. So, and yeah, so that means that education, healthcare, I mean, those are the two important sectors and they are, they can be resistant to automation as long as a society says that. Off limits. Yeah, right. That it's off limits. Um, I mean, of course, you. I mean, ultimately, if you really pushed it, you know, yeah, I mean, of course, every sector can be automated. Just make everything into MOOCs and then do like the surgery robot, you know. Yeah. And uh, and you know whatever WebMD on steroids, right? Um. Yeah, I mean then. Yeah, then 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 the human function is of course no longer needed at all. Um, but yeah, I mean any kind of like jobs agenda would be towards funding education and and education. Uh, and healthcare, um, but it would have to be funded out of sectors of the economy that are still profitable and that still make so much money. So, you know, so, well, progressive taxation, right? Yeah, progressive taxation. You have to you basically you have to tax the shit out of Wall Street and Silicon Valley, right? Mm-hmm. And it's very interesting because Silicon Valley. I mean. You know, like you remember when Occupy Wall Street was happening, right? And, you know, so people were gathering on the square of Wall Street and then you have, and then you have these bankers and, you know, they were screaming at the protesters or some of them, not all, but some of them did. And they said, you know, why don't you guys go home and get a job? You know, that's sort of very, very in a very put downish way. <laughs> And uh, and then if you take the other very successful sector, um, like Silicon Valley, um, you know, supposedly libertarian paradise, and yet you're going to have some of these people like Jack Dorsey is throwing money at, you know, the the Y Combinator, which is one of the basic income uh, experiment uh, group. Um, Humanity Forward, which is Andrew Yang's uh, mm-hmm. basic income foundation, um, and, and and that's funding a bunch of local projects. Which is why, I mean, if you look at uh, on the Stanford website, you can see the world map of uh, basic income trials all over the world. Oh, they have a website. Uh, I have to yeah, check they that have out. that. Uh, and, and what's very interesting oh. is that most of the dots that you see drawn onto the world map actually is now in the U.S. because there's so many. Uh, you could say local trials that are being run. A local level. 
Yeah. You know, like in the Californian cities in New York. Stockton, right? Yeah. Uh, Stockton, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of them. Um, there's one the, the, in North Carolina. It's one of the, uh, the casino reservations, uh, Native Americans. Cherokee, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. So, so there's, there's tons of them around now. And um, yeah, and 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 a lot of that is is, is funded, uh, not out of general taxes, but uh, from donations from Silicon Valley, right? Oh wow! Because this is they have a bunch- stake. They may have a stake. They may have a reason. That's interesting. That's good though. You know, support for uh, uh, basic income trials, uh, and then uh, private entities, I guess, getting involved. Silicon. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Ex- I, I would never suspect that. You know. Well, yeah. now now I could see, we you know the the cynical counter argument from the left. Yeah. Against you know these you know you could call them strange bedfellows. You know why is it that uh, Silicon Valley takes on a progressive mantle even though they're, you know, clearly part of the one percent. Yeah. Um. And, you know, so. There, there's this argument about universal basic dividend versus universal basic income, right? Oh yeah, we've had that fight before, <laughs> right? Um, and so the dividend actually is a much more radical proposal because what you're doing is you would be forcing these big companies, especially the tech companies, to distribute shares to residents of that country. And um, then what happens is, that if the profit goes up, then the dividend payment goes up too. So there's more to distribute. Um, in a basic income project, a uh, basic income program, which is designed by the government, you could develop it in such a stingy way that, let's say, you know, $1,000, and then you, of course, inflation adjusted. So you'll always be able to buy like a small basket of goods, you know, like food and, mm. you know, rent. You basically, that's that's it, right? Um and regardless of you know how crazy the stock market goes, you know how, how much wealth is created in society, you know you you basically you don't adjust that basic income. Uh, oh, you don't. You well, I mean, you know, you, 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 well, you adjust it to inflation, uh, but right. you don't adjust it to productivity, because in most cases, productivity is 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 higher than inflation, right? Yeah. And. Um, then, well, then you well, then you have a difficult argument because you know is your problem absolute poverty or is it relative poverty? You know, is mm-hmm. what has what's the thing that has to be solved for? And I think basic income tries to solve just absolute poverty on the face value, right? But it it may still tolerate relative poverty, right? Yeah, exactly. That, yeah, that, that's, that's what, what the issues. Yeah, just food. You just have food as a basis, and rent money. So it's almost like a social security check, you know. But now everybody gets it. Besides, just reaching the age of sixty-two. But it goes all age groups, I assume, right? After all the age, age groups. Age eighteen. Yeah. Higher. Yeah. And yeah. And so, yeah, I would say at the beginning, you know, if you're designing basic income. I would say let's cap it at about ten percent of GDP. That would be about six thousand uh, dollars. It would be about five hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Now, is this is this not going to be enough in most cases? Um, and maybe we should discuss. Well, there's different ways how to go about it. I mean, you could say you you, you either keep it at the five hundred a month, and then you you do supplements for people who need it. So you know you would ke- still keep the like rent assistance program, you would keep food stamps, you would yeah. keep uh, medical benefits, etc. Um, and you know I'm, I think I like more right wing, you know idea. I think they propose that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know I mean or you or what you could do is you could increase the UBI amount, but then you would you know, then you would decrease the other programs. Mm-hmm. I mean. Is it, I, so the, the, the right and the left fight over this, right? The amount. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, mm-hmm. the, the the goal that you're trying to arrive at is what you might call like utility. You know, like because ultimately, what everybody cares about, like nobody wants to be homeless. You know, nobody wants to be hungry. You know, uh, nobody wants to go without healthcare. So it's like, how can you organize? You know, well, just enough that you have all of those things. Um, but you know, without I don't know, overburdening the the, the acceptable tax threshold, yeah, yeah, in the economy, yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that, that's that's there's always going to be a battle around this, um, and you know, I mean, of course, like I'm not the economist here, like I I haven't sat down and <laughs> crunched all of the numbers because there's also no objective answer, you know, like if, even if people say, oh well. You know, I I, I want to propose, you know, I don't know, three trillion dollars, and then it's like, oh no, it should be four trillion dollars. You know. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that like when people enter into debates about uh, basic income, they often ask about the source. You know, and I made once I, I made a radical like suggestion. I just like auto, I, I just said something. I said, well, why can't we reduce military budget? <laughs> That's a big no no. You know, like. But like I said, theoretically, I mean, the military budget is a big chunk. I mean, you know, how many warships, how many naval ships. And, but people don't think of it that way. They think, that, oh, that's something that has to be totally protected. And nobody is allowed to touch military budget in any country, you know. But, but if you, you know, the, the Stockholm Institute for Peace, they have the data for all the different countries and i can guarantee you that for most cases the military spending is if it's not close to the bulk of the spending you know it's it's a big chunk so it's if if you take a little bit of that you could you could at least have the 500 dollar amount you know you know I would think I would think that would be enough, but that that would be radical. I mean, because some people are just opposed to any kind of uh, you know bringing down military spending. I mean, but it's a big chunk of the budget, you know, the amount. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I was just like recently yeah. you know, reading a lot of like about the Vietnam War um, in the sixties, seventies, and you know, back in the nineteen sixties. So when they started the Vietnam War. They devoted about fifty percent of the government budget to defense spending, uh, mm-hmm. and today, I mean, even as we're fighting Iraq and Afghanistan, it's about say twenty percent, you know, like eighteen, twenty percent, something like that. Um, so hmm. we, we're not. So we, we, we're, we, we're, 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 no, no, of the, of the go- total government okay. spending. Yeah. Um, so we're not as badly off, um, yeah. you know, because because you also have to consider like the other programs have become much more expensive. So you know you have like you know Medicare, Social Security, right. and all that, right. uh, and, and those social programs they're sort of built into the, um, you know, it's built into law essentially, right? Yeah. Like even if you don't change the law, what happens is that there's more and more people are going to hit sixty five. You know. Like all the baby boomers, you know, like the, that's a logic order than the previous one, you know. So, um, yeah, demographic reality, you know, demographic people are going to get older, and uh, yeah, how do they adjust and how do they plan for this amount of people? And they're going to get, you know, they're going to live longer too, right? Yeah, but I, was, I, I, I don't know. I mean, so. To, to the extent that you, we can extend leisure society, right, by hook and crook, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that, actually. Um, well, I, here's, here's a proposal, Larry. You might think it's funny, but, like, we already have in the U.S. parks and recreation. You know, in, in most cities fund it. It's a munis- municipality uh, deal. I think you could expand that a little bit. I think you could include more services around public parks and recreation that fit into leisure society. I think, I think, and what I'm saying is you can expand it. 
Okay, like I, I look at some of these suburbs around here where I live in, in Richardson, uh, which is kind of a semi wealthy uh, suburb uh, north of uh, Dallas. And some of those parks and recreation departments, they have gyms, they have pools, they got lakes, they got uh, public restrooms, they got a lot of acres, people run around, you know, they got bike trails. I'm sure you got that Princeton too, but, uh, but I think you could expand it. And that could be a kind of public benefit. You could also expand public uh, services, like, you know, public transit. Like, I mean, they, they don't really expand it enough yet in the south. I know in the northeast, they've already got public transit. But it seems like you could expand a local government. Public infrastructure, basically. Yeah, yeah you, could, you, could, you could start like parks and recreation. I mean, I don't know if you, you ever look at any city. That's employees. That's money. That's parks, maintenance. That's jobs. Uh, like the one that I go to, it's large. It's like 100 acres. And it's it's massive, and it's it's a it's a benefit for everybody. Anybody can go there. You just you know, you can use it. They have you know public hours, but they have it's a public resource, and I think it's a it's a benefit, you know. But you can expand it. You could. I mean, I don't see why they couldn't expand it over into public housing, which is like a forbidden fruit, you know, almost like some big cities do like New York has public housing authority, you know, even Dallas has Dallas housing authority, but it's like forbidden fruit. As soon as you go into the area of public housing, it's political. Nobody wants to build it around their neighborhood. Then there's a fight over zoning uh, where they want to build the public housing. Uh, it's interesting, but parks and recreation is perfect. So I would put it underneath the, the umbrella of parks and recreation. I wouldn't even tell people it's public housing. I would just, you know what I mean? Just add an extra, you know, 10 people or something beneath it. And just don't call it public housing and just call it something else. Call it recreation. Well, but, uh, so, but it's difficult with housing though, because, because it's a physical object and you have people coming in and out of the building, right? True. But you know, in Seattle, the strategy, I mean, I'm, I think some of the homeless activists, they are, some of them are smart. They know that the public parks is sort of a public arena, you know, it's a public place. So, okay, they, they, they do sometimes boot them out, you know, if there's too many homeless encampments in the parks. But it's, it's this question that the park is meant as a public resource. Right. So in a sense, it contradicts itself when it says, oh, you can't put a tent up, you know, um, and usually there's homeowners or people that get upset and then they make complaints to the city and then they, they get, you know, they get rid of the homeless people or they, uh, take their belongings or whatever. Uh, you, but I could see it expanding to some kind of a, uh, bigger park or something. I don't know. I see I'm, I'm going off now. <laughs> it's getting too late, but you know what I mean? Like expanding public parks and recreation and turning it into something bigger. You know, with some extra services, you know, uh, bike share or something, you know, they can like add another component of bikes that are the city provides. They can ride so bikes. You don't have to, you know, drive cars anymore, right? So, yeah, you can expand. Yeah, you, like you can start to, you know, expand it, expand it, keep expanding it. But I, I always look at parks and recreation as a stepping stone because ever the public supports it, and it's even middle class. It, they, you know, it's more likely affluent suburbs where they put a lot of money into it. Uh, and you can see the, the, the services are a lot better. So I, I sometimes go to different parks here. Uh, in different cities, they have different amounts of revenue. So their parks aren't that good. They don't even have public restrooms. So, but some of the big ones here, they do. Right. Nice. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. They, they Never look at it that way. Like they're a function of you know how much resources that that community already has, right? So, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you're gonna have the inequality and stratification, and I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I was just finished reading the book by the Princeton historian here, uh, Julian Zelitzer. Uh, it's about the uh, fierce urgency of now. So he wrote about the Johnson era, um, you know, great society. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, you know all of the you know government benefits that people are still relying on today, and but, but the whole idea is that you know Johnson's idea was that because he so he grew up um, 
when he became a congressman, it was during the, the Roosevelt era, right, FDR. Uh, and that was, of course, the very first expansion of federal government uh, in terms of like overall spending. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so when he then became president, he said, well, you know, we're going to have to do the same thing again. And we're going to have to, what he said, you know, complete the, the, the new deal, which is um, uh, through the great society, you know. To, 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 Ames. To, to, and, and, and a big, <laughs> right, and a, and a big part of that, you know, federal program was um, it, it's sort of like funding that goes to its local communities, but they're not interestingly not directly controlled by the municipal governments. I mean, so the federal government teamed up directly with um, community organizations, you know, with churches, you know, with uh, private uh, you know, foundations, etc., and. Uh, and you know, just lo- lo- local community activists, and, and and they were you know providing you know things like job training or um, you know it, it could be some like public park project or something like that, um, and that that that's I think what should be happening right where because I mean that, that's always a concern that I have I mean because I mean I debate conservative friends and. You know, it's interesting because my conservative friend is not anti-government. You know, he's 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 pro-government, but pro-local government, mm. which means anti-federal government. And um, and to me, it's like I don't have any sympathy for that. You know, anti-federal argument because because ultimately, I mean, the so there's this there's several asymmetries between the federal and state, right? So the biggest asymmetry is control over currency and control over debt. Because, uh, you know, in a lot of states, you have balanced budget amendments, which is the reason why, like, you know, you saw during COVID, you know, why are there so many cops and firefighters, teachers get laid off? Well, it's because they, because they operate under this bu- balanced budget assumption. Mm. You know, the federal government does not because they're, can just you know um, borrow, yeah. and they and not only borrow, but the fact that whom are they borrowing from? They're borrowing from the Fed, <laughs> and the Fed creates the money, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it, there's a lot of tools that the federal government has, and also you know you you subvert this argument about tax competition, which oftentimes exists, you know, where it's like. You know, to use your example with Elon Musk going from from California to Texas, mm-hmm. it's like, oh my God, I'm not having to pay these taxes anymore right, in California. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you know, well, I guess you know the U.S. would still be in tax competition with outside jurisdictions. You know, like the you know, whatever tax shelters in in the U.K. or something, but. Um, but it's not. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely more f- castle from the side of the investors. You know, if if they wanted to subvert U.S. tax laws, right? Um, mm. Also, the U.S. is a very interesting way of doing taxation, which is, you know, they tax you on your global income. So, so if you're a U.S. citizen, you know, and you make money in other countries, you would have to declare to the government. Yeah. And whatever difference that you don't pay to the uh, government, that uh, the, the country that you work in, uh, you're going to have to pay to the, to the U.S. government. And uh, yeah, a lot of other countries don't do that, right? Um, mm. They allow you to keep it, right? Or they don't tax it. Exactly. Yeah. So if you if you, if you're if you're a German citizen or Austrian, and you you work elsewhere. I mean, there's no there's no reporting requirement. You know. You just you just go out and have fun, essentially. You know, <laughs> uh, the U.S. government is one of the few countries that's like really has huh. a global tax regime. Uh, you think that's because of the amount of millionaires or billionaires that it's uh, a very large uh, top earner bracket, a top earning group that would affect uh, you know tax revenue. Or you think they just do it because they can, like this, the U.S. government does it because they they can. They they want to show that oh, we're the state, you know, and we're going to collect tax if you if, even if you make money outside of the U.S. I'm curious how that works with someone like 
you like 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 Elon Musk. I mean, well, he I guess he earns it here, but he does have multiple citizenships. I think uh, Elon Musk is uh, he has a Canadian yeah, and he has yeah. yeah, so he has the multiple citizenship. So I'm trying yeah, to think the, how that works those two other countries. They're not really yeah, they're not the money makers. I mean, like he's not gonna you can't be rich in in South Africa. Right. Um, but he just pays, I guess, taxes in the U.S., I assume. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just pays. South African government US. wouldn't. Yeah, that would I be mean, they, they look, Yeah, the main examples you would have to bring up is people that, you know. Travel. Yeah, and that, that go outside the U.S. And the Americans that go outside the U.S. Uh, and, and then you'll feel the, yeah, you could say the pain of dealing with uh, the U.S. government. Um, huh. Uh, but you know, but I think you know. But I, I know all of that is to say, really, that you know, suspicions against federal government don't make any sense. I think no, you know, no, it's no. a way to, you know, you, you need the, the federal government to, yeah, like, like if, if the outcome you care about is equality, you know, like, you take take the vaccine example again, right? Uh, the way how it works is that the federal government procures all of the vaccine, and then. Uh, and then the distribution goes through the state governments, right? Mm-hmm. So every state gets an allocation of the vaccine, which was proportionate to the population. And as if, if you still remember, like last month, there was a big surge in uh, in Michigan and cases. Mm-hmm. And the Michigan governor wanted to get extra vaccine doses. Uh, and right around that time, actually, you know, you saw the vaccine demand coming down. Uh, in some of the southern states like Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, like those, those, those states do very poorly with the vaccination, right? Yeah. Because, you know, there's a lot of rural counties, you know, people don't have access to primary health care, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, uh, and so the mission governor said, you know, give me extra vaccine. Um, and the federal government didn't do that. Because yeah, they, they because they didn't want to they didn't want to look partisan, you know. Yeah. And yeah, so for me, it's like there's anyway there's not such a strong case to be made for surging vaccines because because you know even like I looked at the Michigan numbers, like they weren't taking advantage of all of the vaccine allocation in the first place. Like they were using up seventy five percent of the vaccine that there was allocated. And you have some states where it was over ninety percent. So, mm. so I I don't think the surge would have made any difference. Um, but they turn they turn it into a political issue, uh, I guess people out from the outside. Yeah, yeah, and then you start politicizing it. I'm yeah. very worried about it. But then at the same time, I'm I'm actually glad that Trump is no longer president because, <laughs> yeah, because just like a source of nuisance is just gone. You know. Yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, it's like people were always like, oh my God, what is this guy tweeting again? And then January 6th happened. And then I think, you know, when you saw that video on January 7th and he said, oh, well, you know, you could see in his face, like, I fucked up, man. It's like, oh. Um, And that's true. But uh, I live in a red state. You don't. (laughs) That's the problem. (laughs) Well, but it's also very interesting. I mean, you should look at the electoral results where, yeah. you know, well, when, when six points for Trump this time, and um, it went nine points four years ago. And, you know, when, you know, when Bush was still governor, I would say it was like 20 point lead or something, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, I think well, I would I would account for that in Texas for demographics. I think the the counties are changing, the the urban areas are changing. El Paso, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth. It's just a lot of a change in demographics, right? Which I, mean, that's yeah, what yeah. I think it, what's happening. But uh, political stuff too. There's just political change um, as a state, you know, which used to be very religious, very conservative, but now it's uh, changing. You know, it's just Texas is changing. So, some people say it's purple, purple state now, or purple state, perhaps. 
that's where it's moving into. I mean, if you look at the recent uh, voter ID laws that were signed by the governor, mm -hmm. the same thing in Florida. I mean, it's it's really about you know making sure that you know make it hard again to you know make make it hard for the Democrats to win it, right? Uh, and so hard, um, yeah. Uh, I talked to my Democratic friend about that. He, he's of uh, the same opinion. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he makes a yeah. That's true. It's it's, it's 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 suspicious. You know why this voter these voter laws are being passed now? Uh, well, I mean, so yeah. you know, so th th there might be you know to some extent a legitimate argument if you just said mm -hmm. like a clean, simple voter ID law, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's simply like okay, you know, you have to have driver's license or a state ID. No, uh, already have that. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, if you already have that, then I think then that's it, you know. And of course, that's the provision that they're always playing up, right? It's like, oh, you know, the Democrats want, you know, yeah. undocumented people to be voting. You know. I think right now you're not allowed to give water bottles while waiting in line. That's something that, it has to have. <laughs> those are ridiculous rules. <laughs> I know. Um, Somehow you're 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 spreading propaganda when you're sharing the water bottles. <laughs> Yeah, how dare they give water bottles to people? <laughs> and so the, the the two sticking points for me is like mail ballots, um, restricting mail ballot access, uh, and <laughs> and then also like the the timing of voting, right? Yeah. If you say, oh, you know, there's only like a narrow window, like pre uh, early voting. Yeah, they reduce. Yeah, it. yeah, you, you restrict early voting. You 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 only have so you you do polling on the weekday, right, when most people are working. Uh, and you have very short hours in that day, you know, like that, that, that to me is, that's very anti-democratic because I mean, what's wrong with having early voting, mail ballots, you know, give extra time, you know, I mean, of course there has to be a deadline as with anything with uh, when, when things should be get uh, sent in, but um, you know, it shouldn't be unnecessarily, unnecessarily restrictive for it. Yeah, um, I'm with you there. Yeah, but totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's power considerations. I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, tr trying to hold on to power, you know, yeah. for, for 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 you know as long as possible, right? That's true. Yeah. And, All right. But but I mean, I think that the overall like the demographic shift, as you mentioned it, you know, like the fact that the large cities is like growing you know a lot uh, mm. i think that makes a huge difference it's going to make it yeah it's the, it's all regional purple. yeah i don't know about you know other states but i'm more familiar with my state that i live in so i guess in uh, northeast uh us you 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 have more metropolitan urban areas so you have less rule i guess right there's no, hardly no rule there's some rule where the state you live? No. <laughs> very well, actually, it depends. Cool. So in New Jersey, it's very yeah. hard to find like a completely rural place. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's all density, right? All yeah. It's well, it's 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 very suburban. I mean, with the exception of like um, yeah. Camden and uh, Newark and that area, but uh, you know the rest is like very very suburban. Uh, that's a feel yeah. to it. Um, yeah, Texas still has a rural. Uh, you know, outside of the cities, it's very rural, and where it's rural, it's more conservative. So, um, it's just it's it's a large state. It's a very large state, and there's development. The cities are expanding very large, and it's bringing about a lot of uh, un unnoticed consequences, like ecological, like we've had water issues for the last few decades, and it's going to get worse because we've got more population. So. And it looks like they're not going to implement water conservation. They're just trying to like look for more lakes to suck dry, <laughs> and but they're not planning. I think they're not they're not planning like they should. Like with uh, you know temperatures going up and the summers that we have and and the water waste that we have, we have we have a real problem. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do about it, but uh, some of the cities here have water scarcity. Oh, well, summers well, they have to like not water certain days so so, so you so you actually being told that you cannot use water yeah some of the cities uh like they'll have a month or two 
they'll say like only Tuesday, Thursdays, you know, this, this, this street can water. And then there's a penalty. There's a fine. Um, there, that's for, that, for the grass, right? Uh, yeah. The yeah. The, the sprinkler systems. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have that kind of a system, but like if, if, uh, you know, people, people are homeowners then they have you know sprinkler systems especially the affluent communities around here like they have a lot of water usage and they have bushes and trees those are not natural those are all man-made you know so it's a lot of water usage uh, here because everything will dry up everything dries up with the heat when it gets hot so and people like to have it green you know that's that's all water waste you know and the water is a drinking water. It's not separated water, so it's another problem. I mean, uh, like if if you treated the the grass with, uh, you know, ocean water, I mean, would that, like, would it make a difference? I mean, uh, you know what? I think it's salt water. It's salt like, water. I think yeah. in I, I I think the way it works is. Uh, the water that they use for the, the, the grass here is all public water supply because there's no alternative, unless you got rainwater and that you're storing, but there's really no other water source. Uh, Larry, I don't, I don't think there's any other water source. There's in Texas, you know, has the, we do have lakes. There's a lot of lakes, large lakes, but like anything else, they dry up and then they have to, <laughs> You know, then they have to. What they do is they bring down the the, the water temp, the, the water pressure. You know, when everybody starts using a lot of water, they bring it down all the way. That happened last year in the so, summer. So that means there's less water coming out. That's a yeah. You can't get as much water out, and it's just doesn't it doesn't allow you to get a whole. Yeah, that's one solution. I've never had it to where they didn't have water, but they will bring down the pressure. It's a real eco you know, real issue in i think a lot of southern states will have water issues uh next few decades yeah then the question is like why people would have the fetish for for the lawns right uh, no I, I think they should ban it to be honest I'm, I'm really that far out i think they yeah. would need to ban pools i would go after that first like the private pools you know you can have a public pool <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 see the homeowner has a pool I guess around. people are concerned that like you know they don't want to live in a neighborhood that looks like a desert e yeah. even though like like look if the if the environment if the climate you know makes the place that you live in a desert then oh. it should look like a desert right, right. I mean, you shouldn't I mean because I I know that like in terms of human evolution you know there's a reason why we love lawn why we love green why we love trees you know because you know it, and you know we plant trees everywhere here right um because it's like because that's where the hunters and gatherers used to live right close yeah. to the trees close to the green you can um, the, the the fruit trees you know the the dates that you can pick from the tree and whatever i think i know where you're going now with this i think i know where you go what direction you're going um you could argue that all of this home ownership, all of this middle class communities take on a kind of bourgeois utopian worldview, you know, artificial everything. And it's unrealistic when everybody does it, especially in an area where there's scarcity of those resources. So I would argue it's the planning of how they built the, the cities are unrealistic. They didn't think about it 30, 40 years ago, you know, whether the you have, you know, let's say in a DF, DFW area, you have, I'm going to say 6 million, 7 million, but it keeps growing. It's hyper growth. This is an urban, uh, what do you call it? Spr sprawling? Urban it's sprawling. Sprawling. Yeah. yeah, it just it explodes. And I don't think it's, it's a bourgeois utopia. It's just like, where are they getting these resources from? They had areas where they built uh, planned communities and the water wasn't available. <laughs> so they had to truck in the water. I mean, that's how crazy, that's how re real estate operates. Like, do, do you guys have pipelines? For yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Rich, like you have city, if you're in a city uh, that's close to the DFW, then, you know, you're okay. But there's some of these... Uh, new developments because we got all this uh, population coming from California that they're growing these cities uh, so rapidly. 
you know, you're talking about 20,000, 30,000 people that come in, you know, every two months. And they're not, I don't think they're planning like you think they would. There's not a lot of planning predicting what impact this is going to have on the ecosystem, on the water, traffic. I mean, the, even the highways we have here were built, you know, 30, 30 years ago. The bridges that we have here are old. Um, and they were not considering the population growth. So it's, 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 a, it's a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, you can just see it by looking at the roads. It's just, it's always, you know, filled with cars. Yeah, you see, yeah. and that's that, that, that's the issue where, so uh -huh. if, I, if I was an economist, right, and I would, you know, and all I do every day is look at numbers on Excel sheets, right? And I'd yeah. be like, hey, look at this, you know, Texas population growing, GDP growing, you know, tax revenues growing, everything's great, right? And if I submit my report to the governor, I'm like, you know, you do a good job, right? <laughs> exactly. Not, uh, but, but then the problem is like, if I, as the same economist, if I went out in the street, the picture. Saw my whole neighborhood is being clogged up and, you know, mm. traffic jam because there's so many people driving, uh, you know, there's so much pollution, you know, like my, my lungs, I'm coughing all the time, you know, whatever. Uh, and, you know, there's not enough water in my area. As you say, the water table runs low. I'm just like, don't you think that there's such a disconnect here? Yeah, exactly. Between, you know, the, the, between the abstract thing, which is apparently good and great, and then my the, the concrete experience, which is uh, dealing with the ecological limits, right? Uh, uh, what did Purdue call that? Habitus? Habitus? Like, I think in the academic... The habitus is the attitude, right? Uh, yeah, the, the academic milieu, let's say the economist, uh, or even academic, they are restricted with their discipline you know the, the methods and, and techniques that they use within the, within their discipline so you're absolutely correct i mean just doing something like participant observation or just going outside the communities is alien to them and uh observing social problems recognizing social problems you know like we have i think we have that gift right a sociologist we can just sort of see it problematic it's it creates problems uh homelessness you know we see it so that we recognize whereas an economist might say that's, that's just i'm not saying all but they might just factor it in as part of you know the equation right even uh i don't know in your community is there a lot of panhandling or or uh, going on well informal, right, right informal, where stuff, uh, informal uh, uh, formal labor or informal you do you have day laborers in uh, Day laborers. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, this is very interesting because we have. So I mean, it's not a thriving economy because it's a small town, but uh, you have, you know, a bunch of businesses on the main street. You know, like the restaurants and shops and things like that. And um, and then you also have the you know the lawn mowers, like the landscaping yeah. people. And and we know that almost everyone is. Uh, is is Mexican, you know, like or it's like of, of Latino descent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, and, and and then you could see the local town's population, you know, the professors, the students, mm. you know, the other professionals, you know, it's, you know, mostly white, you know, like you know, here and there are some Asians and blacks, but you know, but, but it's not, but but you can definitely see that there is a enclave. That there's an enclave. There's a segregation yeah. that's happening, right? I mean, um, I mean all, all of course, the housing. housing. Is that also with housing? I guess housing is also kind of segregated. If you want to use yeah, that so, word? Yeah. Yes, because yeah. because so along my street, I mean, these are all like family homes, mm -hmm. single family homes. So, uh, so the the Mexican workers are definitely not living there, right? Uh, they, they they live in another part of the town, um, you know, like this these buildings. Uh, go, it's, it's like cramped apartments, I would say. That's yeah. where they stay at. Uh, mm -hmm. Or 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 like you know, they oftentimes because they often ride with a bicycle, uh, so they might just be riding on to you know another part of town outside of town where there might be some cheaper places. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, so so living segregation, um, 
Yeah, and also yeah, the division in the labor market. That's for sure. Uh, okay. So yeah, I mean, all, all, yeah, I mean that that's yeah that that that's 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 how that's how the social economy is structured ultimately, right? Yeah. Um, that's interesting though that even there's similarities between where you live in Princeton. You know, look at a town like Richardson, uh, which is a suburb of uh, Dallas. It's the structures of cities are so e- interesting in the United States. They often uh, copycat. I don't know, they duplicate. Uh, so even the same businesses, the same, not always the same restaurants, but the same stratification, the same, uh, you can see the, the differences of wealth within cities, uh, enclaves form. It's really interesting, you know, like, um, so yeah. So city, uh, we're going to Chicago School of Sociology, right? The city is the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Louis, Louis Vert. Yeah, uh, Park. What are the other guys named? Park, right? Park, yeah. Um, and, you know, Hull House, I think that's also the origin there. Yeah. Um, a, little si- a little side note, I have a uh, mentor of mine um, who taught to me intro to sociology. Uh, Adrian Tan and my first sociology class we like we went to like cemeteries right and I never thought of it as being relevant but then I I finally learned the lesson like you know like even city uh, cemeteries and cities are quite unique and you can uh, tell a lot about you know cemeteries and where they're located within a city and uh, you know they obviously are often old aging but it's really interesting you got to try that one day <laughs> go go to your i don't know Prince well there, there, there's two cemeteries yeah. right in my neighborhood i mean literally yeah. i mean the block down you can like just do like you can go in there and just i mean if they allow you you know like take pictures yeah yeah it's all it's open you can just go yeah it's it. it's really fascinating because for me here in uh uh, Dallas, there are some historical cemeteries, and there are obviously cemeteries in affluent communities, and there's some in working class communities and middle class. But, but you know, something like that, you just you know, just walk around your own city uh, spaces, and it, people neglect it. They don't think of it as a scientific or a social scientific project. I think it's relevant. I think I think I think you go you do like stuff like that. It, there's a lot of insights. Some of them are maintained, uh, but I don't know. But some some are locked down. Some of the cemeteries they don't want people to go in. But I don't know how it is in Princeton. I don't know if you have the a professor cemetery, you know, where they put all the dead professors. Yeah, you I'm know? not sure about that. <laughs> Ivy League or uh, the big names. Or yeah, I mean cemeteries yeah. is, is hard to study because <laughs> because we we we. Because we have a bias to study living people, and yeah, I, well, I think you could get exemption for IRB. You wouldn't need any. <laughs> well, they're dead, right? So yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they're not living. Well, so the way I mean, there's a way how to study dead people, but it's usually <laughs> historical sociology, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, just, like um, I would, I would classify it as visual is. sociology. I would do like a, a more of a arts based approach, you know. Both, both of the design of cemeteries, the stratification of it, the uh, religious diversity of it. I don't know if you can get social class out of it. You know, if you can get some kind of, you know, the, how they're the tombstones or it's the stuff we do. Right? I, I, I'm, I'm sure, like, if, if, if you put your mind to it, I think, I think we can bring a story out of that. And, and I'm sure, like, hmm. the book publishers will be all over it because, yeah, you know, I'm sure about it, you know. No. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. Uh, yeah, dude. To me, it sounds, uh, it sounds hard to bring anything out of it because you know when I go into the cemetery, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, I had like you know three of my grandparents uh, that uh, passed away in my lifetime. So I'm sorry. Um, that. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's like I mean, the, the the there isn't anything like you know positive in my view about um, you know yeah. cemetery. I mean, of course, you know. Maybe you visit it because you know it's where they're buried. Yeah, that, I'm just bringing it up because some of, some of them are interesting to study, but some of them are irrelevant. I mean, I understand sometimes they don't have anything that could be relevant for uh, soci- sociological study, but sometimes in the South, particularly in the South, there are some that are segregated by race, right? So yeah, so I mean yeah, that that's, that's the thing. thing. So yeah, 
you know, if, if I had to simplify sociology, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a studying variation by race, class, and gender, you know, like that's sort of, a, <laughs> uh, that's sort of like a simplified take on it. Uh, right. as, 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 long, as long as you do that, one of those three things, I think you'll find basically it's uh, sociology. Anyways. So, so yeah, so I mean, if you have stratification, race stratification on, you know, burial sites, burial grounds, and you know the way how it's maintained and things like that, and then you interview a bunch of these uh, uh, cemetery uh, workers, managers, yeah, workers, yeah, um, and yeah, I'm I'm sure you, you can bring us studies out of that, uh, yeah. but. It, it, it's it's always like it's it's always like this issue of like how much sociological imagination do you have? I mean, like I I met somebody like a few years ago in my undergrad years, uh-huh. uh, a, a guy who was studying sleep. Oh um, yeah, that's a topic. All right, yeah, yeah, it, this is quite interesting. And then I was like, well, how would you do that? And uh, and I did. I mean, I I never read any of his work, so I don't know exactly what he was doing, but. But you know, I guess it's, you know, you just observe how they sleep and maybe yeah. the, the patterns, the habits. You know, you interview them afterwards or something. I'll do a Compton analysis of how sleep is portrayed in advertisement material. I guess you yeah, know, like yeah. uh, advertising yeah. of sleep uh, as a. Now, yeah, I, mean, if, could... I feel like a neuropsychologist, right? I mean, yeah. I think it makes absolutely sense to study sleep. Because the data is basically like whatever the brain scan, right? That uh, that you yeah. take when you're sleeping, right? Um, now, I've noticed sleep is a topic. I've, I've seen that a couple of times. Yeah, a couple of people have written on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but mostly from a from a neuropsychology, neurobiology perspective. I mean, yeah. From, um, yeah, but sociology, I, I don't, I, I don't know because it's always. Because you because you always have to identify the link with the social group. I mean, so for instance, you could study the social determinants of sleep. You know, like um, you know, like I don't know, during the pandemic, Class, occupation. Yeah, so, during the pandemic, you just take a survey of you know mothers with young children and you know how sleep changed and stuff. That would work. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I I saw recently a study by. Uh, Rupana, Leah Rupana, she's in Melbourne. And uh, it, it was about um, labor participation rate of um, mothers and fathers with children. And I mean, her argument is basically that, well, the empirical data suggests that, you know, mothers with young children, so those below the age of six, they are the ones who are dropping out. Hmm. Of the workforce in large numbers, which to some extent makes sense because, like a primary school kid who is you know hooked up to the Zoom, whatever for the homeschooling, you know you could leave that kid by by himself or herself. I mean, you just you know provide him with food or whatever, right? But right. you'd still, I mean, you know, maybe some people could still focus on their work, but then. For very young children, it's very difficult because because so for very young children, you need physical supervision. Yeah, social skills. Yeah, yeah you'd have to you know, like whatever change the diapers. You know, you have to you know communicate more with the child. You know, like there's no because the like, the older the kids get, I mean, like they want more independence from the parents. They might be spending more time online. You know, things like that. Um, but the mothers with the young children, they were, they were being, you hmm. know, I don't know, forced out of the labor force. Uh, yeah. Well, that theoretically, that would make sense if you use a feminist perspective, like, uh, was it the second shift uh, idea? And uh, even uh, Nancy Fraser, you know, her argument about, she uses this idea of uh, care and, backstage of capitalism and front stage of capitalism that a lot of the household work done by women uh is the backbone to our economy but uh you know uh, it's not counted like 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 real labor 
and uncompensated like real labor. So I guess it's a kind of hidden injury of the women, a hidden injury of class, a hidden, a, a, a shadow form of labor that's not counted. Or what would you call it? A form of labor that's not counted as labor, even though it is labor. You know, this whole uh, child care and household tasks and uh, even elderly care to some extent. It's, yeah, a, it's, it's an unpaid labor. form of uh, work, right? At least I think that's what most feminists would argue, that it's unpaid work. Care is not compensated the same way like our jobs. I guess, I don't know. So that's kind of what uh, the argument yeah. is. Well, that might explain why a lot of women maybe, uh, yeah, likely to not, you know, they can't do both. And it has an effect on their paid employment, if they have paid employment. Like the unpaid household work. Yeah, I mean, on this issue of like unpaid household work, I mean, that that that's a huge part. I mean, I think the feminist, uh, you know, economists say are completely right. I mean, I mean, a huge part of the, you know, labor is is uncompensated, and it becomes a subsidy to um, to employers who who employ family members that uh, you know you know, do provide the work uh, to, to that company, which is usually the husbands, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but then of course, the complication is now, okay, because a lot of women are working now. So then it becomes a double burden, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, is it, is it just, there's only one positive development, you could say on behalf of women's rights. Which is uh, technology, right? So this is with the book by Robert Gordon. He talks about rise and fall of American growth, and uh, he says that you know household technology was so important to you could say free women up mm. um, because you know you're not having to spend so much time. So the the, the biggest thing is basically wa washing clothes because washing clothes that could have been an activity that took an entire day, right? Uh, but you know the washing machine just cuts that down. You know things like that. I didn't think of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but yeah. So yeah. Also, technologies are important for the the you know more women in employment and things like that. I would suspect disparity between upper class mothers and working class because of the. Uh, you know, the, like some of the upper class, they have domestics or even uh, people that work in their homes reduce some of the work, workload. But the working class women may uh, have to go to the con coin laundry facility, you know. You got to commute, then you got to do your laundry there because you don't have your own appliances and you got you to bring it back home and you may have to dry it, you know, uh, on a line or something. So I think, uh, you know what I mean? Like upper class women will have uh, maybe their own domestic helpers. I yeah, you know well, I mean? they have to be really rich in America. Though. Yeah, really rich. I mean, even the upper middle class, they do most, they, they don't really have helpers. I mean, yeah, so you have to cut to the really upper layer of society. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, there's some countries where the middle class can actually afford to have uh, helpers, domestic helpers, mm -hmm. um, uh, like you know, India. I think you can still do it. Um, yeah. You know, labor is starting to get more expensive now, but um, uh, that's it, generally what happens. You know, like it just like the salary that you would have to pay to domestic helper um, is just so much higher in a rich country. Uh, yeah. And also, like given the fact, going back to this household technology, is I think. Uh, a lot of the tasks that is done by the domestic helper uh, could be done with uh, with technologies. Um, now, we, the the thing that's, but the thing that's hard to automate is childcare. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, the key task, right? Bringing yeah. up the child, but then like everything around it, like you know, vacuum washing cleaner. machine, yeah, vacuum, all these things. <laughs> That I think, yeah, that you can increasingly automate. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's the next frontier. I don't know if people, 
you know, are relying on, you know, like Zoom and things like that uh, for instruction. Um, there's a lot, a lot of self-teaching. I mean, like I, I learn a lot of stuff in YouTube tutorials nowadays. <laughs> so um, you don't actually... I mean, it's it's a person who teaches it, but you just have to record it once, and then, yeah. and I, 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 I mean, like if if you're a very self motivated person, I think it's a gr- great thing that we have you, things like YouTube now. Oh yeah, yeah, because um, yeah. you know, because I I I just love the idea of like having the world's knowledge in, in your fingertip, you know. Like, <laughs> It's like Wikipedia. That's what Wikipedia is for. Wikipedia, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. all of my blog posts now, I mean. Now, if only we can get rid of the paywalls for academic journals, right? <laughs> well, there's a way, there's ways around that, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. I think I should let you go now. Oh, uh, no, yeah. Um, that was great, Larry. Uh, uh, it was awesome. We should do it. We got to have more people next time, right? You going to stop recording? No, it's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's do the... Thanks.